start the meeting uh, good morning and a warm welcome to all of you for joining this webinar on uh, marine insurance and beyond theory practice and case studies in fact uh, we are very heartened uh, to see such a large participation and in fact uh, we had to regulate your entry and that's why i think uh, this uh, webinar commencement got slightly delayed but uh, i think we are now at maximum capacity that's a very uh, positive sign for us in the imf Uh, as uh, some of you know, the IMF has been organizing such seminars, such an annual event uh, in years past uh, until the year around 2019. However, for the last few years, uh, we, along with the rest of the world, uh, were affected also by this COVID pandemic and uh, could not do so. So, both last year as well as this year, we have decided to conduct these events as webinars, and hopefully, uh, in the foreseeable future. we may be able to shift to in person seminars which uh, is a little more personal and more interactive now today's topic of uh, marine insurance is not something that is well known to most of the community and uh, i think certainly not to me as a formal naval officer despite my 37 years of experience nevertheless uh, i too feel that it is a very important topic because ships as we all know excuse me there are too many mic mics working we cannot hear anything One second. So I think uh, okay. I think that should actually have muted everyone. so as i was saying that uh, marine insurance as a topic is very important because ships as you all know whenever they sail upon the oceans the oceans are fraught with a number of risks and dangers and therefore despite all the technological advancements that have uh, been uh, brought into force still uh, ships can have accidents whether they be due to acts of god or whether they be due to acts of man but whatever the reason whenever an accident occurs there is consequential damage to both property and often to life as well as to the marine environment which naturally brings up the aspect of compensation in the form of marine insurance today as you can see we have a very distinguished panel of experts who will share their views on this subject of marine insurance and i'm sure that uh, this webinar which will be there for the next 3 uh, odd hours will no doubt educate you as well as stimulate the mind your, your mind because uh, they will also be uh, carrying out some very uh, analytical case studies on many of the incidents that have taken place in the past and uh, giving their own experience on these incidents so without uh, much further ado i will uh, say a few words about the imf Uh, ours is a non pune based non profit organization which was founded almost 28 years ago by kamdo rajan veer our former president and uh, who is now the president emeritus the imf is a voluntary organization which is run by a group of retired indian navy and merchant marine officers and our main objective is to promote awareness of the ocean and to rekindle maritime consciousness and pride among the people of india especially the youth before we commence the webinar uh, i would like to just flash a few points uh, for the attention of the audience firstly the audio and video of all attendees uh, have just muted on commencement uh, i have given the speakers and the uh, moderator co host right so that they have certain uh, permissions which are over and above the regular participant uh, during the lectures uh, i would request that uh, people avoid using the chat for making some general comments or uh, sending emojis and use the chat mainly for the question and answer session which is at the end of all the lectures and also keep the chat comments uh, as i mentioned uh, for the end and during the question and answer session uh, you will be given the rights to unmute yourselves and you may ask questions either in the form of raising the hand which you will find under the reactions uh, uh, button which is there in the main menu just below the main screen or you can type your question in the chat box and the moderator will pick that up and uh, pass it on to the panelists Uh, the moderator will control the sequence of the question and answer and uh, other than the person asking questions uh, we request the others to kindly remove, remain muted during that time 
Uh, this is the program which I'm sure all of you must have got. Uh, we have started a little late, as I mentioned, uh, and we hope to conclude uh, this uh, webinar by about one o'clock. And uh, with that brief introduction, uh, it is time for the welcome address, which will be delivered by Captain Anand Dixit, the President of IMF. Uh, Captain Dixit is a master mariner who has spent more than 40 years at sea. He has served with the SCI and several foreign companies and was also in the cadet training program of the SCI. He has commanded ships of various types, including general cargo ships, bulk carriers, tankers, including a VLCC of about 276,000 DWT and 316,000 DWT. He has qualified as an accredited lead auditor for ISM certification, undertaken lectures at the Tolani Maritime Institute, and is a former chairman of the Company of Master Mariners of India, Pune chapter. At the IMF, he was at the helm of Seagull for 12 years and took over as a president of the Indian Maritime Foundation on the 7th of January, 2020. With that, I'll hand over to Captain Dixit. Request Captain Dixit to unmute himself. Uh, are you audible now? Yes, yes. Okay. So, distinguished guests, participants, speakers, moderators, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. And welcome to the fifth of the lecture event organized by Indian Maritime Foundation. Our uh, theme today is Marine Insurance and Beyond Theory, Practice, and Case Studies. The inspiration behind opting for this subject was Dr. B.K. Saxena, who showed us how interesting this subject can be when handled by competent speakers. So let me introduce and welcome our speakers of the day, starting with Dr. Saxena himself, founder, principal, TMI, a marine engineer, and an academician. Additional Director General Vijay Safekar, President's Tatrakshak Medal, again Tatrakshak Medal, Indian Coast Guard, retired. Mr. R. Balasundaram, an insurance practitioner who holds senior executive positions in insurance companies and institutes. Mr. Tony Fernandez, what can we say about Tony? Everyone knows him. He's an insurance practitioner who holds, uh, well, uh, he's, uh, sorry, uh, ex seafarer, ex serviceman with uh, Indian Navy background, and one of the most highly regarded personalities in the field of insurance in India. No seminar or webinar or lecture can be complete without Tony's presence if the subject is insurance. Captain H.J. Deshpande, a rare combination of practical seafaring and academic excellence. Shipmaster, Bombay pilot, lecturer, examiner, mentor, in fact, everything. Captain Pankaj Kapoor, Master Mariner, BSC Insurance, LLB, LLM, PG Diploma in Maritime Law. That is truly awe-inspiring. And finally, finally Captain Sibida, a sailor, scholar who represented India at IMO, shipping executive, examiner, and procedure for change in various marine acts. A warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for giving your valuable time for this webinar. The history of insurance dates back more than 3,000 years to Phoenician era or even before that. To send a ship out to sea with valuable goods on board has always been a risky proposition. The chances that the ship will reach its destination, deliver and load merchandise and return safely to the base port were only about 50-50 in those early days. 
So it is no wonder that a sea voyage was called a marine adventure, a term still used in marine insurance. In the relatively modern era of Queen Elizabeth I, there existed an insurance act. The preamble of that act is very interesting. I will uh, read that out. It says that upon the loss or perishing of any ship, the loss should alight rather easily upon many men than heavily upon a few. Easily upon many men than heavily upon a few and rather upon them who adventure not than that do adventure. In other words, people who are risking something must be protected from the loss that may be incurred. And the loss must be spread over a number of people who are participating in that particular marine adventure. Those words are as significant today as they were when first written. Without marine adventure, without marine insurance, the development of trade, which we witness today, would not have been possible. Advancements in science and technology have made modern shipping much safer than it was in the times of Elizabeth I, but perils of the still, perils of the sea still exist. The recent case of the car carrier Felicity S, which went down with something like 4,000 luxury vehicles, is a reminder that sea voyage is still a marine adventure. Whereas the traditional marine insurance was limited to compensating the ship owners and cargo owners for the losses or damages they might suffer, the civil marine pollution has introduced a new factor, the third party liabilities, which sometimes overshadow even the uh, main claims of damage and loss. It is argued, and perhaps quite correctly, that marine pollution is not an insurance matter, but more a pay and subject. But be that as it may, just consider the expenses involved following a uh, incident of uh, marine pollution, the cleanup cost, the civil liabilities arising from damages to the environment, damages to property, loss of revenue by third parties, civil penalties, criminal fines, and the legal fees. All that adds up to a formidable sum. Just to give some numbers, in case of Exxon Valdez, oil spill. The cleanup cost alone was something like 2.6 billion US dollars. And the total cost after meeting all the claims and liabilities came to around 7 billion US dollars, uh, which I believe included the cost of habitat restoration. Now, without some kind of protection from such liabilities, it would be quite impossible to operate any oil tanker. Our eminent speakers today will enlighten us on various aspects of uh, marine insurance and IOPC fund. And we certainly have an interesting morning ahead of us. So welcome again uh, to this webinar, to all the participants, speakers, moderators, and with that, I conclude my welcome address. Over to you, Captain Sobedar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Captain Dixit. Uh, uh, we now move to the opening remarks, which will be delivered by Captain Sudhir Sobedar. Uh, Captain Sobedar had joined P.S. Dufferin in 1966, graduating with a first class certificate. During his career at sea, he has served with the SCI and the Anglo Eastern Company shipping companies and also held uh, several important shore appointments. He is a former director of the Ocean Sparkle Group of Companies Hyderabad and the Indian National Ship Owners Association, 
the former CEO and president of the Indian Coastal Conference Shipping Association, that is ICCSA, a member of the Academic Council of Kolani Maritime College, and a warden mentor and next founder, president company of uh, Master Mariners Pune. He is also an advisor, regulatory authority, government of Assam, and a member of the Sea Ganga Project, Ministry of Jal Shakti, as well as the Royal Institute of Naval Architects, International Ship Masters Federation, Company of uh, Master Mariners of India, Institute of Quality Assurance UK, Royal Institute of Navigation, Indian Maritime Association UK, and the Governing Council of Logistics Skill Council Chennai. He is a recipient of the Exim Award. Award for Excellence by the Indian Sea Trade Kochi, the Sailor Today Media Group Award for Exemplary Contribution, contribution to Indian Shipping, and has been twice nominated for the National Maritime Day Award. May I request Captain Sobhidar to deliver his remarks. Thank you, Admiral Natkarni. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. After lucid explanation of the webinar today by Captain Dixit, there is little for me to add on, given that we have started a little late. But I would like to put on record that we should pat our backs for developing and giving gift to the world the concept of insurance, the concept of spreading the risk in any given activity, which in the formal stage is at least 500 years old. The technological changes, the digitization has made businesses more complex than ever before. But we are catching up with everything that is possible in terms of digital technology and replacing the old terms and paperwork. At the core of insurance, as was mentioned by Captain Dixit, is risk and is spreading as thinly as possible. Given the uncertainty and the loss of insurable interest, which could be anything between relationship of a thing and the insured. It must be established beyond doubt between the parties concerned in utmost good faith so that risk is undertaken for maritime adventure, that is any voyage that takes people and goods across the oceans. Therefore, at the end of the day, insurance is a contract of sorts between the insured and the insurer, given warranties and guarantees that are strictly followed so that compensation is defeating the loss and not a profit motive. Some of these in the modern times is going through turmoil, such as loss of containers, container ships, luxury cars ferried across seas, going on fire, collisions and groundings, where passage planning or otherwise is being questioned. If such a risk have been undertaken and established and evaluated. Over the next two hours, ladies and gentlemen, we will hear four speakers and summing up by Captain Pankaj Kapoor, the youngest amongst us at, at, the, at the panel, legal mind which is being used 
at all forums, nationally and internationally. And I hope that the speakers will tell us the theory, the practice, and the way forward, particularly for changes that are required to Marine Insurance Act 1963 and practices that are being followed there under. I request participants and 100 plus delegates that are listening to this webinar to put their searching questions in the chat box and look forward to an interactive session at the end of the four speakers and before the summing up by Dr. Pankaj Kapoor. I now call upon the opening batsman to deliver his presentation. Dr. B.K. Saxena has been introduced by both the convener and the president of IMF. I might just add that he's been my colleague for 40 odd years. a par excellence trainer and trainee who is now going to deliver us theory and practice of marine insurance. Dr. Bika Saxena, please. Can you, can you stop sharing so that I can open that? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Captain uh, Subeda. Can, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Uh, am I audible? Just uh, some reaction. You're audible, uh, Dr. Saxena. Okay, good, good. Okay, good, good. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I remain a student actually, I'm, and uh, more so a student of uh, marine insurance. Uh, I am a member, both myself and my wife individually are members of uh, IMF. Uh, so I'm happy to be here and uh, uh, it's great uh, that uh, uh, I've been asked to talk on, on, a, on a particular topic which is uh, quite close to me. Uh, I'll be touching two parts. Uh, one is the marine insurance theory and practice part, uh, which will be the first about 10, 12 minutes or so, 15 minutes maximum, or even about 10 minutes or so. And then remaining 20 minutes will be on ever given, you know, which is uh, the one which has shaken the world. Uh, six days uh, uh, stopped for the Swiss Canal and lots and lots of things uh, which are related to that. So I'll be touching on uh, some of them. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, marine insurance, uh, uh, how is it different by, uh, by other uh, insurances? It is different uh, because of what you see in the red here. Okay? Whatever is mentioned in the red, uh, that uh, makes uh, things a little different. Because in all other insurances, uh, you know, uh, if your loss is X, you get X. Uh, suppose you insure your car uh, for 5 lakhs on 1st January, and if your car is gone, uh, stolen after 6-7 months, you will not get 5 lakhs, you will get 5 lakh minus uh, depreciation. Okay, because that is your loss on that particular day. Okay, but shipping is like uh, different. Okay, marine is different. Not shipping, but marine is different. Because the extent is already agreed. Okay, the extent is already agreed. So if it is agreed that the value of the vessel is uh, $10 million. Any time during the next 12 months, if it goes down, full $10 million will be uh, paid. Okay. And the manner can also be, you see. So there is a mechanism which is called new for old. So if the loss is, uh, you know, an old auxiliary engine, which is 10 years old, is damaged, uh, hull underwriters will give uh, a new one. Okay, So that's what uh, makes the marine insurance little different. 
and this is the definition as per the uh, Marine Insurance Act of India, which is uh, very similar to the Act of uh, 1906 uh, from uh, UK. Okay. Uh, now, what all comes in marine insurance? You see, uh, first is obviously the vessel, then cargo. The freight can also be insured because the freight can also be quite uh, uh, quite a bit, and the freight can also be at risk. Liabilities extremely important in any operations and marine operations, of course, very critical. So different parties, uh, whether it is ship owner, whether it is charter, whether it is manager, uh, different sal salvers, they can become liable, and therefore they have liabilities and which can be insured. Uh, you have a war risk. Okay. Uh, uh, recently, I mean, in fact, it's uh, still going on. One of the Bangladesh uh, vessel uh, is gone, and the claim is twenty-two point four six million dollars. So that is the war risk uh, insurance. Then the legal cost uh, insurances, uh, that is the freight damage and dispatch, loss of hire and earnings, and finally uh, kidnap, which is with res uh, respect to uh, piracy. Uh, okay, out of this, uh, at least some of them will be uh, will be coming into for discussion when we talk of ever given. Uh, there are certain principles of insurance. Uh, I'm not. I'll just rush through this uh, very, very quickly. First is uh, insurable interest. Uh, what it means is uh, anybody who is buying insurance must have must have interest in that. What kind of interest? Financial interest. That means if that thing remains, he's satisfied. If that thing gets damaged, he feels financially uh, suffering then he has uh, insurable interest and therefore he can uh, or she can insure that particular thing indemnity is uh, uh, as we have already discussed uh, the amount uh, of compensation the assurance which is given by the insurance company that what if you have a loss what is the maximum we will give so that is indemnity Utmost good faith. Whole insurance works on this utmost good faith. Hundreds of insurances are taken all over the world. Uh, nobody comes from the underwriters to have a look uh, at the risk. Okay, uh, everything is done uh, just on whatever the insured says. Okay, so uh, that is a very important principle, and uh, I'm going to come back uh, to this in just a few minutes. Uh, approximate cause, that is the root cause, the main cause which has started a chain of events which finally uh, led to loss. And finally, subrogation. Subrogation is, you see, when somebody's property gets damaged by Mr. A, for example, the property owner has a right to claim from Mr. A. But if he claims or if he chooses to claim from his insurance company, that right to claim from the party which has caused damage gets subrogated to the underwriters. So that is called subrogation. Okay. There are four other terms which uh, we will just rush through. The first one is assignment. Assignment means transfer of a valid insurance to another party which has now become the owner or which has now got the interest. Uh, in hull insurance, in the ship insurance, this is not permitted, this is prohibited. Cargo insurance, it is a requirement because the ownership changes when the cargo is going from seller to the buyer and therefore assignment has to be there, but hull insurance cannot be uh, transferred. Deductible is an amount which is agreed by the insured and the insurer. And up to that amount, there is no insurance. It is something like a retention of risk, or uh, you can call it as a self-insured. Warranties is another uh, very important part, and I just know it was referred also. Uh, warranties are the promises which are made 
by the insured to the insurer that this 12 months this will be done or this shall not be done for example a very simple thing is that the vessel shall remain in class for 12 months okay or vessel shall not go north or 70 degrees okay. so these are examples of warranties or the ship shall be uh, seaworthy or shall uh, shall be operated for legal purposes only and then of course uh, we have losses uh, which i am going to uh, show you now these are the type of losses which are insured uh, the first one is the partial loss. That means when that thing is partially lost or partially damaged. A total loss could be actual. That means either that thing is missing or there's no way we can get it back. Constructive total loss is when we can get the ship back, but the cost of removal, cost of taking to the dry dock and repairs, etc., uh, increases. Uh, or estimates are higher than the insured value, then you declare it as a, a constructive total loss. Uh, general average uh, is the average means loss, the general loss. That means any action taken to make sure that the adventure continues, such kind of uh, sacrifices and expenses are shared by everybody. And uh, that is called general average. The salvage, of course, is quite uh, simple. And uh, sue and labor. Sue and labor means any action taken to minimize or avert a loss. Okay. So if it is done reasonably, the underwriters would pay for that. Okay. Again, some of these will be uh, coming in when we talk of ever given. Okay. Uh, Captain Subedar talked about the Insurance Act. Okay. Uh, see, the two very important things, one is this utmost good faith, and the second is the warranties. Now, as per the Insurance Act of 1906 of UK, and also our Act of 1963, if there is a breach of utmost good faith, the underwriters can avoid the claim. If there is a breach of warranty, they can, uh, they, the, uh, you know, they obviously they will not pay. You know, so there's slight difference between the two of them. <coughs> now, uh, the law commission in UK uh, called this uh, as a draconian law, draconian act, because if the warranty is broken and that has not caused the loss, it's still the underwriters are not going to pay for it. Okay. So in UK, they brought in a new act called Insurance Act, and they made some changes, okay, uh, which provides, uh, uh, you know, at least some relief. Okay, uh, I had made a presentation uh, two months back uh, in IMEI, and uh, at that time people said that, yes, in India also we must have, uh, but there's no use of changing only this act, because what we have today is applicable to all insurances and each one of us take insurance okay it may not be marine insurance but you take insurance of how you take insurance of your car your property etc etc uh, and therefore we need a brand new insurance act uh, not just the marine insurance act but a insurance act like what uh, uk has done okay. Hull insurance uh, covers uh, uh, all these things, that is the loss of uh, damage to the ship, liability, that's only collision liability uh, is also covered by Hull and machinery. Uh, all these I have already explained to you as to uh, what, what uh, these means. Uh, the P&I insurance, uh, liability insurance is a very important part in uh, ship operation. P&I covers the liabilities, two types of liabilities, contractual liability, that means there's a contract between A and B, there's a breach, breach of contract, and then uh, uh, the liability arises, and the second is the liability under tort, what we lose, loosely call third-party liability, okay, a civil wrong liability. 
there are some areas which cover bo under both uh, alloy machinery and p and i like collision liabilities fixed and floating objects uh, general average and salvage okay so this is a little bit of theory but now let us go back to uh, the main part and that is ever given okay uh, my motivation to, to uh, talk on this is based on uh, almost about seven or eight uh, international webinars attended uh, by me uh, and uh, i have literally read e anything and everything which was published in, in the uh, in the public domain on this particular topic but more importantly uh, four articles by my friend uh, uh, mutu jagan uh, who has his own uh, company claims company in singapore he is also attending but unfortunately he couldn't come in so he is on the on the uh, youtube who's watching it uh, he has written four articles on this which are very good articles on this uh, particular topic okay uh, <clears throat> so this particular ship which caused havoc in the world caused havoc to the supply chain uh, closed the swiss canal for 6 days was owned by a japanese company the panamanian subsidiary of that company and it is time chartered to evergreen of taiwan okay uh, the management was uh, by bernard schulte uh, it's a, a very new ship 2018 ship the class is abs uh, the flag panama indian crew of course it's a huge vessel Uh, length is uh, 400 meters, and where it ran aground, uh, the width was only 200 meters. Okay. Its PNI club is a, a very big one, the UK PNI club. The hull insurer, uh, there are three of them: uh, the Japanese one, okay, uh, the salvage company. Uh, Smith Salvage, which is uh, one one of the largest one, and the Nippon Salvage, the Japanese one, both were appointed by the ship owner, and of course uh, the Swiss Canal Authority also uh, did a bit of salvage. The average adjusters were Richard Hogg, one of the largest uh, uh, average adjusters company in the in the world. A little bit about the the. incident uh in the morning uh, the timings are all gmt 0530 hours the ship entered uh, swiss canal and uh, it was going at uh, 15 at uh, 13.7 now interestingly the the maximum speed uh, permitted for this kind of a ship is 16 kilometers uh, per hour which works out to be 8.64 8.64 knot that is the maximum permitted as per the documentation of the uh, swiss canal authority i am not getting into uh, what caused uh, the vessel to run aground i am not uh, really discussing on that it only the uh, insurance related one uh, 5 uh, 55 44 the vessel grounded uh, the salvage team arrived the vessel was floated Uh, around 1300 hours on the 29th then it proceeded to the great bitter lake in the canal uh, on the 7th of april a claim of 916 million was uh, raised which covered four things one was the cost of the salvage number two the damage to the canal number three loss of reputation and number four loss of earnings uh, now that itself is a is an indication uh, because when this happened there were almost about 400 ships which were waiting on both the sides but when the canal opened all 400 passed so they have all paid to the swiss canal authority so how how is that the swiss canal authority lost so much of money okay of course some people Uh, some ships which were near sri lanka or something uh, when they realized they would have gone around the cape okay and vice versa but uh, 
definitely this this claim was uh, highly padded up incidentally the uh, the value of the cargo is, is somewhere around 550 million and another 25 million for the containers okay so that is the the, the value which was there on the ship the claim was much much higher than that the ship was arrested uh, by an order of the egyptian court on the 13th of april okay the appeals were made and appeals were rejected and again the matter went to the court and again it got rejected and uh, uh, some very interesting uh, things came out, especially by by uh, an, an, an Egyptian lawyer uh, from Alexandria, who very openly said what really transpired on, on the bridge that time. Okay, uh, but I'm not really going into that because, but that is uh, very, very, uh, uh, very, very damaging. And probably that was the reason why the Swiss Canal Authority uh, really came down. Mm. So finally, on the June third, they said they will reassess. Some kind of an agreement was reached, and finally, uh, the solution was reached on the fourth of July. What is the amount? Nobody knows. Okay, so that is not made public. Okay, but it is expected that is somewhere around three hundred million. Okay, uh, ever given departed and uh, went to Port Said for inspections and some temporary repairs. Then finally, the first port of call Rotterdam, the second port of call Palixto to discharge uh, all the containers. Uh, there were about 18,000 odd containers. Okay. And uh, thereafter the vessel empty, uh, returned back in the Swiss Canal, went to the, the Beihai shipyard in Chindao in, in uh, China for the uh, repairs. Okay. So that is the uh, the timeline. Okay. Uh, just to to show you, uh, uh, this is the Gulf of Suez and the vessel. Uh, if you can see the there is a there is a bend here. There is a bend here. So the vessel was going like this, and after six kilometers, it ran aground. Okay, like that. It got wedged on the side. Okay. Uh, some photographs. This is a satellite photograph. Okay. Some very, very interesting photographs. You can see the desert. And, uh, okay. Anyway, now what I'm going to show, you see, insurance only comes if there is a loss or if there is a liability. Then only the insurance comes. Otherwise, the insurance is not here. Okay, so we will have to see first which are the parties involved and what are their relationships. Okay, so the first party is obviously the ship owner, which is the Japanese ship owner. And the claim was, or the claimant was the Swiss Canal Authority. The relationship between them is the user agreement. Uh, any ship which crosses uh, Swiss Canal has to have that. Okay. Uh, the ship was on time charter to Evergreen. This is on time charter. Okay. The ship was also having a hull and machinery insurance with the, uh, the three companies. So that is the hull, hull and machinery policy. So that is yet another relationship. Okay. When the ship ran aground, the salvage company was appointed. So that is yet another relationship. That is a salvage relationship. Uh, now Evergreen was also working like an operator of the vessel. Uh, but the, the ship was under uh, working under a consortium. Okay. Uh, under a consortium uh, called Ocean Alliance. And there were four companies which are operating. Okay. So you have uh, Evergreen, you have OOC, OOCL, you have a COXO, uh, and uh, uh, CMA, CGM. 
what does that mean that means the bill of lading could have been issued by any one of them now the interesting part is that these two bill of ladings are as per the english law this is as per the chinese law and this is as per the french law so, so you can understand how complex uh, things are becoming the halan machinery insurance was on japanese terms so japanese insurance terms okay uh besides that there are some 400 odd ships waiting now whether will they will have any claims against anybody okay and on top of that the ship owner declared general average okay so these are the different uh, relationships and uh, different uh, uh, problems which uh, need to be seen okay so the salvage uh, related one so these are very interesting uh, photograph of uh, salvage and of course this is the uh, the main salvage being done by the uh, by the smith and the nippon the salvage was uh, on on a commercial contract uh, not on the lloyds open form that means the the terms were uh, pre agreed uh no in general average of uh, See here, what has happened? The, the ship owner has uh, probably paid off the salvage and claimed that salvage under the GA. Okay. Uh, besides that, as per the rule six, uh, ten, eleven, and fourteen, uh, temporary repairs, uh, wages, uh, uh, bunkers uh, when a vessel is detained, etc., could all be claimed under under the general average. Uh, the general average uh, of course is going to take long time to settle but the security has been finalized at about 25% okay now general average uh, there are certain rules uh, your kentrop rules now which one will be applicable most probably 1996 uh, because at least the evergreen uh, bill of ladings are referred to 1996 can the ship, uh, cargo owners have any remedy against this uh, yes they can provided the test is that if there was no ga uh, could they have claimed against the ship owner for damage if yes uh, and we have seen recently uh, cma cgm libra where the uh, the cargo owners could uh, dispute Uh, the payment of uh, general average because the vessel was not seaworthy, but that probably will not happen here. Okay. Uh, who are the cargo owners? Uh, there are many cargo owners who have uh, full containers like IKEA and uh, a whole lot of other ones. But there are many cargo owners who are LCL cargo owners. That means in one container you have uh, different different cargos. So we are talking of almost about twenty thousand plus. Uh, cargo owners so the ga will have to be shared by them plus the ship owner plus the evergreen uh, because they are, they have the bunkers there property as well as the containers there you know so it's going to take a uh, long time with that halan machinery uh, issues okay obviously these are the photographs from the Uh, repairs uh, carried out uh, in the Beihai shipyard in Chindao, uh, where the nose job was done. the 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 forward uh, bulbous bow was damaged, and so was the stern side. And these are the photographs after the uh, repairs have been carried out. Now, what about the cargo insurance related issues? Hull is straightforward. Uh, cargo insurance, uh, as I told you, there are different different types of cargo owners. what are their terms are there any damage to the cargo highly unlikely uh, as long as power is uh, there the, even the reefer cargo would be working you know so the, the delays most of the time uh, the insurances do not cover delays so in other words uh, uh, we don't see much of cargo insurance uh, related issues 
uh, accept uh, these two parts. And if at all they have to claim who is the carrier, as I told you, uh, four different uh, uh, parties. And besides that, there may be some freight forwarders who may have issued their bill of ladings and all. So that could be quite a, quite a complex thing. Okay. Uh, almost about 25%, 30% of the cargo is not insured. What happens to that? How are they going to pay for it? Okay. So that is going to be another issue. Of course, it is all sorted out. So now it's only a... But uh, this is one of the problems uh, which happens in a container ship where a lot of cargo is sometimes not insured. And if something goes wrong, uh, problems can happen. Now, liability-related issues. Of course, P&I coverage uh, comes into picture. The fines which have to be paid to the P&I, to the, to the Swiss Canal Authority will be covered. The damage to the canal, uh, fixed and floating object uh, section clause, it will be covered. The damage to cargo, as I said, there's hardly any possibility. Uh, salvage contribution, in case the uh, hull and machinery, there's a problem, it will come here. Uninsured cargo, we touched on. Now, what about liability towards other owners? Those 400 owners, will they have any claim? Can they demonstrate that either this ship owner or the Swiss Canal Authority had a duty uh, uh, towards them to provide a safe passage? And because it was not provided, they really suffered loss. So in that case, they may have a loss, but again, uh, not very easy. But charters, yes. Charters issue can come in too because of... Uh, and the contribution, the GA contribution, because the charter being the evergreen, uh, they will have to pay the, the GA contribution based on the value of the bunkers as well as uh, the containers, uh, which is about $25 million worth of containers. Are there any reinsurance issues? Yes, uh, the hull and machinery definitely uh, will have a faculty, facultative uh, uh, reinsurance. So that will be there. And P&I, of course, definitely. Because P&I works on uh, pooling arrangement, especially those 13 clubs. So the UK P&I club, which is the main club, will have a liability of only $10 million. That's all. Okay. The remaining uh, $90 million will come from the pool. And all... Above, suppose it is a 300 million, that means 200 will come from the reinsurance. Okay, so reinsurance will definitely come into uh, picture. Okay, so these are the different, uh, you know, just one uh, one accident has caused so much of problem. And I'm not talking about disruption, but purely from the insurance point of view, we have a hull and machinery insurance issue, cargo insurance. Liability insurance, charters liability, and of course the uh, the reinsurance issues. Okay, so with this, uh, I have sort of rushed through this, but I hope I've finished within the time uh, allotted to me. Once again, uh, thanks to IMF uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, to to talk to you about this very. Uh, I mean, uh, it's I I won't call it. it Interesting, of course. I mean, it is now it is interesting, but rather sad case of uh, ever given. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. I now call upon ADG Sapekar of the Indian Coast Guard to tell us going beyond insurance claims in particular, protecting the marine environment, a cover that is over and above insurance loss. Over to you, ADG. Thank you, Captain Subeda. Well, uh, the topic is uh, International Oil Pollution Compensation Fund, challenges to claim over and above insurance cover. 
I would like to approach this topic from national perspective. India has exclusive economic jurisdiction in the maritime zones measuring over 2 million square kilometers and there, there are maritime safety interests beyond maritime zones. This national interest in the maritime zones and beyond are to be protected. If we look at the shipping traffic through and in the vicinity of our maritime zones and the slide on the picture shows a typical satellite AIS picture of shipping traffic. And add to this, tens of thousands of fishing boats out at sea at any given time, and we get a dense maritime domain picture with a potential for incidents and accidents. And associated with this incidents, accident is, are the issues about liability, claims, and compensation. Well, the basic framework for the uh, liabilities is covered under Brussels Convention, limited to the extent under LLMC 76, covering loss of life, personal injury, and property damages. The extent of compensation available under this is of the order of $20 million. But a Tory Cannon incidence disaster opened the eyes of the world to the pollution damage consequences, the huge economic consequences, consequences of what Captain Dixie said, said about the third party damages, which are to be, uh, which are to be compensated for. Well, the available compensation under existing regime was grossly inadequate. So there were two concerns which were triggered. One was about the tanker safety, that is prevention of pollution from the tanker, which was addressed by Marco 73-78. The other was some coverage cover for the pollution damages. It was created through Civil Liability Convention of initially 1969 and the Protocol 92. It provides for pollution damages resulting from persistent oil leaking from a tanker and, and it is discharged through mandatory financial security or insurance. Most important part is pollution damage cover also includes preventive measures taken and there are certain exception clauses as shown on the slide. The liability of ship owners is limited as per the size of the vessel and it is again of the order of 20 to 25 million dollars. But if you remember the Tory Cannon experience, the consequence or economic consequences were in of the order of hundreds of billion dollars. But then there is a limit to which you can hold ship owner liable for this pollution damage consequences. And uh, it has to be viable for ship owner to play, and that's why the limit was set in the CLC. So we have to find another source for to provide cover for liabilities beyond ship owner's liability. Well, who pays for it? There is oil spill risk because there is a tanker traffic, and tanker traffic is all happening because there's a demand for oil and states are importing oil. So it zeroes down the oil industry and state importing oil. And accordingly, the International Oil Pollution Composition Fund 1992 was created with the funding from oil industry. And how it they pay, it will be covered later. But the fund basically pays for the compensation, which is if it is inadequate under ship owner's liability or in excess of ship owner's liability. But what is important is that the provisions of the fund are very similar to that of CLC. The fund is kind of a supplementary convention to CLC. And therefore, someone for to become a member of the fund has to be a member of CLC. And how to get compensation from the fund? Well, first, empowerment courts have the courts must have the jurisdiction. Next is the fund should be notified. And even if the fund is not notified under the fund convention, fund has a right to intervene if the issue owner or insurance. Proceedings are in, initiated against ship owner or insurance. Then fund acts a verdict. What it means is that as long as two conditions are met, that is the pollution damages are on the account of persistent oil. And that origin is from a persistent oil carried as a bulk, that is from the tanker. If these two conditions are met in the most cases. And for what we can see from the data available from the IOPC fund is that most of their 156 cases in which they were involved they settled the claim even before the court verdict was passed. Now, how it is financed? It is financed from the contribution from the contributing states and depending on all, all those states which import oil more than 1.5 lakh tons. How much? It is each year the amount is decided based on the budget requirement of the fund, that is carry forward funds, carry forward liabilities, and how much the contributing oil is reported. Based on that, they decide how much per ton to be charged. And the quantum of compensation available under this 
is of the order of two to three hundred million dollar, depending on the kitty available with the fund that year. But what is most significant here is there are 120 member states and only 60 states qualify to pay to a spot tributing oil. That is probably they import no oil or less than 1.5 lakh tons of oil. Now, what is it is normally when state becomes party to any convention, there are obligations to the convention which they take by joining the convention, and then there are certain benefits. But in this case, the 60 states who do not contribute. They are, they are entitled for compensation under the fund at par with other participating states. And this point we'll discuss later. But, but for now, Erika spill changed something else. It saw to that the total compensation available from CLC, that was about 20 million, and together with the fund, about 200 million, was still not sufficient because the claims exceeded their 600 million. So certain states who thought their risk was much more and it needed to be covered, they pursued and we have a supplementary fund of 2003. Here again, the contribution is by oil importing states. However, the key point here is only the member states who pay, they get cover under supplementary fund and the on order, the quantum of cover available is up to $1 billion. And there are as of now 32 member states and India is not. Why particular state will choose to be part of, excuse me, <clears throat> part of fund or CLC or supplementary fund that will be brought up later. A simple case studies which are there, we have a prestige spill. This tanker was leaking oil uh, in the November 2002 of Spanish, court, uh, Spanish coast. The response strategy of the Spanish government was to tow away the vessel from their EEZ. However, about 140 miles, the vessel broke into two pieces and nearly 60,000 tons of oil, which was floating, viscous oil floated onto the shores of Spain and France. The claims were so huge that the fund and the insurance had to set up offices in these two countries. Limitation under CLC and that could together with the fund was 170 million. However, the claims piled out to almost thousand million dollars. Here, how it was worked out was the fund, insurance, ship owners and the state government they sat together and decided to scale down the requirement of the compensation to realistic level. And as I gather from the IOPC fund, the French government offered to stand last in the queue for the cleanup cost or whatever the state government invested to uh, deal with this spill. And that is how finally the amount was brought down to 573 million and 30% pro rata payment was made. Looking at the incidents in India, we prominently remember MSC Chitra, which was really created havoc of Mumbai in 2010 and thereafter Rak area, it was not so significant of Mumbai in 2011, but both the spills were bunker spills and therefore fund was not involved in this. Empty Don Conchipuram, which was a collision uh, in 2017 of Enor port. Again, it was a bunker spill, but the 92, 1992 fund convention covers a bunker spill from an oil tanker. However, we find the way this case was done, the fund was not notified, but all the claims pertaining to Coast Guard, Endor Port, and State Government, as well as the information available, they were settled. Coast Guard and Endor Port were settled in full. But this issue remains how, why the fund was not involved when the bunker spill from a tanker is covered under 92 fund. There is one case, only one case in this, in which IOPC fund was involved, was empty Pavit case. The vessel ran aground of Mumbai, and it was a dangerous situation. There was oil, bunker oil in it. The, uh, on the instruction of DG shipping, salvers removed the oil, refloated the tank, and it was towed away to the port. The point was whether uh, fund gets involved in this, because there was no, uh, the vessel was unladen. There was no oil, uh, crude oil in it. However, the, whatever the residues were available, they were sent to the test to the lab in L London, and they were aware of the crude oil, so the fund in principle agreed that the conditions are wet, that vessel actually carried, it doesn't matter how much quantity, even if it is smallest of the quantity, crude oil, and it was a tanker from this, there was a risk. Well, initially the West England p &I club had said that their insurance was not current at the time the incidents happened, but thereafter between the fund and insurance, it was agreed that they will uh, co cooperate for the compensation requirement. And uh, what was uh, main point was, was there a grave and imminent risk 
by this vessel which was grounded and uh, as what i understand from the fund website is that they prevailed upon the insurance to pay for the this part of the salvage that is refloating and removal of oil because if you go by the procedures or provisions given in the fund convention if the insurance doesn't pay the fund would have paid this money there are other two components which remain unsettled was the towing amount by sci to the airport and a small portion of those card where the helicopter was sent in 2 and 1/2 lakh as per the records this claim was sent to dg shipping as per procedure but as per website it was not settled as time bar and we'll discuss it later i want to just mention about this charge tarbos washing ashore we have the uh, reaching to the goa coast and one of the seminar i was asked to ask a question how we can get this clean up cost of this tarbos uh, claim and i just suggested that if we can meet these two conditions that is the forensic uh, reports of this uh, oil spill fingerprinting reports of this uh, tarbos can prove that its origin was crude oil and the drift model of the oil slick if we can say that it cannot drift from the production facility was more likely it has come from the passing tanker traffic the two conditions are met probably we can explore this compensation from iopc fund in fact i had sent a mail to them to confirm whether it is qualifies or not i didn't get a reply but i recently find there is a ongoing case of israeli coast that they had this huge tarballs washing ashore in the from the mediterranean side they did exactly they carried out a test to show that this origin of this tarballs is a crude oil and then they further proved that it is unlikely to be from any other production facility but but the passing tankers and iopc fund website shows that this claim is being considered for settlement finally the map on the screen shows the states which are party to the clc fund and supplementary fund what is significant here is we can see that china is party to clc but not to the fund and most significantly united states is not party to clc or fund now how state decides to party is depends on the risk and the cost benefits by not being party i can tell you china has set up their own domestic domestic fund for oil pollution compensation this fund premium that oil industry pays to this fund in china is more than what is what china would have required to pay for oil oil pollution compensation fund and the guarantees available or cover available is less than what is available under iopc fund how it's debatable that the money which is given to the fund in china remains in the state and which goes to funds goes out but that is how china has taken a call in case of united states it is not party to both this clc or uh, fund united states as just mentioned earlier that they had one of the major oil spill disaster in, in terms of exxon valdez in 89 and after that they made oil pollution act 1990 this act provides a very very stringent provisions and it not only the stringent provisions for the compliance for tanker safety there is a fund created of the quantum of 1 billion dollars to which is uh, if uh, similar to what the iopc fund provides but all the contributions to fund don't come only from the oil industry but the stringent laws in, law enforcement which happens for the non compliance with opa the penalties are also deposited with the fund well these are the two sides to it how as far as india is concerned the contribution that goes from india to the iopc fund it varies year to year but i have seen that on average it comes to little less than 1 million dollar each year in last 10 years so it is the result on this whether which kind of model is best suited for india but finally to conclude is fact that we haven't had a major tanker oil spill in india but going by the tanker traffic which is there to the gulf of kutch and so also the passing tanker traffic and the, remember there actually have been two major tanker accidents with the tankers broke into two one of gulf of kutch and one uh, in the ez of mumbai fortunately both these tankers were unladen imagine what would have happened if they were the fully loaded tankers i feel what is lacking is the more uh, need for a more organized approach to secure full range of compensation if we look at what is the national law provides as far as iopc fund is concerned in merchant shipping act the provisions which are reproduced from the convention text in the act are those pertaining to our obligations to the fund however there is nothing about who will notify the fund who will educate the stakeholders who are entitled to get the compensation from the fund as i said we have a contingency plan which is not 
backed by any uh, legislation, that contingency plans provide for delineated duties. And one of that is that we, who will deal with the claims and compensation according to that operational legislative post guard census claim to the uh, DG shipping. But what happens to this IOPC uh, option which is available? Better awareness I mentioned. And if coming to the title of this uh, topic today, challenges to claim from the IOPC fund, I feel rather than challenges, there are phenomenal opportunities, a lot of opportunities to obtain compensation from the fund. For example, Coast Guard claims only the cleanup cost for every oil spill response operation. What happens to the consequence to marine environment? Assessment of that and restoration cost. All this is covered under IOPC fund. If there's an institutionalized setup to carry out all this, reimbursement can be obtained from IOPC fund. With that, I conclude. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm not a practicing insurance person, nor I'm expert on the subject, but my field experience and service experience, I decided to choose this topic and talk about it to spread awareness. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zafikar Sahib. Uh, it's been overdue that in India, we get very little back from the IOPC fund for more than 30% of contribution globally that comes from the import of oil to India. Awareness is the key to propel towards claiming under the IOPC fund, provided there are measures that can be demonstrated with proof of cleanup and livelihood enhancement. Said that, I now call upon the next fast bowler, popularly known as brother, Tony Fernandez, to tell us about marine insurance in particular, hull and machinery and domestic shipping. Over to Tony, please. everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. And I would like to put my presentation up. So I'm sharing the screen. Can you please give me the permission to share the screen? You have permission, sir. Okay, thank you. I'll just. Hmm. You will have to uh, go to that particular window, sir, where your presentation yes. is. Yes, yes, I'm doing that just now. And this place. Is it visible now to everyone, please? Uh, no, sir. We are only seeing the file explorer, sir. You have to open the presentation wherever uh, you have. Yeah, I've, I've opened the presentation. Are you not able to see it? No, sir. No, sir. We can see it now. You can see it. It's visible. Your presentation is visible. Okay. Right. So, uh, namaste and welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm most uh, grateful to the Indian Maritime Foundation for having invited me to share my thoughts on uh, marine insurance today. 
I wish to simply ask a question on what's the state of marine hull insurance in India today? Is it uh, a float or is it a ground? And before that, I would like to make a disclaimer that the issues discussed in this presentation are based on facts personally known to me and which I believe to be true. No names of persons, businesses, sports, places, or vessels will be mentioned, except for the case study, which is in the public domain. The purpose of the sharing is to create awareness of the challenges and concerns relating to marine hull insurance in India and is not a criticism of any entity. The views expressed by me in this presentation are mine alone and do not necessarily represent the views of the organizers, the sponsors, or any other persons or entity connected directly or indirectly with this presentation. So I would like to cover a brief introduction and the objective of this presentation, a brief history of marine insurance in India, marine hull insurance underwriting and the challenges, marine hull insurance claims and their concerns, and speak about the case of the very large oil and ore carrier Arun, which was a vessel which was broken up in Alang and which was the largest vessel ever to be broken up. And last but not least, we'll have a summary and conclusions. So first is a grateful acknowledgement to the Indian Maritime Foundation for having invited me and for the kind words said uh, by Captain Anand and, and, and Captain Subedar. There is a need to speak up. And this need to speak up is because we all have responsibilities and these responsibilities are in direct proportion to our involvement and our professionalism. And therefore, sometimes, although unpalatable, it becomes a duty to highlight challenges and concerns. So we will reflect on the past, the present, and have a peep into the future, which is the way forward. We'll talk about continuous professional development through learning and sharing, which is the need of the hour and a wake-up call for action with specific reference to marine hull insurance. Last but not least, we'll suggest an action plan. Professionals blend theory with practice. Theory is thinking, opportunity, opportunities to use theory to enhance practice, and practice is doing the opportunities to practice, to reinforce and redefine theory. And this is a continuous process, and which is what professionalism is all about. And this is adapted from Neil Thompson's theory and practice in human service. Creating awareness by speaking up. Silence becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out and acting accordingly, says Mahatma Gandhiji. Awareness is all about restoring freedom to choose what you what you want instead of what your past imposes on you, says Deepak Chopra. So caveats for speaking up. Let us look not back in anger, nor forward in fear, but around in awareness. You have to speak your mind, but without being cruel. And if you speak up, be ready to back it up. Otherwise, just shut up. So these are the uh, foundations or the basis on which this presentation is made. And all that I say, I have facts to back up if and when necessary. The objective of this presentation is to explain the background and history of marine hull insurance in India from ancient times to the present day, to highlight the challenges faced in the, in the underwriting of marine hull insurances in India, both for ocean going ships and inland vessels, to discuss the concerns in the processing of marine hull insurance claims and the reasons for the same. And lastly, to share the travails, the torture, that is the mental torture, the trials and trauma of a ship owner of a very large oil and ore carrier, that's called Arun, which was the name of this vessel, in respect of a total loss claim. And this is in the public domain, and you can read the uh, case which went up to the Supreme Court on the internet. And that is why I'm, it's being in the public domain, 
I mentioned in the bank. So let's look at a brief history of uh, very hull insurance in India. There are many Indian references to transfer and sharing of risk, whether it's in the Tirukural, which is the Tamil epic, or in the Arthasastra, or in the in Manu's treatises. So whatever uh, these great uh, historic Vedic references are rarely mentioned uh, in uh, textbooks around the world, but India being a maritime nation, there was always references to concepts of maritime aspects, including bottomry, respondent shear bonds, general average, maritime salvage, et cetera, in our ancient, in our ancient texts. Early insurers of Indian sailing ships 150 years ago were the grain merchants and oil merchants of Porban. And their risk assessment was one simple question. When the freight brokers went to them, asking them to insure sailing ships, they just asked a single question. Tandale Ponche, meaning who is the master? And on hearing the master's name, they decided whether to accept that risk or not. Till about 60 years ago, Indian insurance policies had the name of the master inscribed in it. Those days are gone. And I think that was the necessity for the ISM court to come in and restore the authority of the master. In the future, whether there would be some type of tracking of track records of masters and seafarers for insurers is just to be seen in the area of uh, where data acquisition is being used for decision making. So now we come to the pre-nationalization era, prior to 1972, when Indra Gandhi nationalized the insurance industry. There were hundreds of uh, insurance companies and there was in specific five insurance companies in all is situated in Porbandar, which specialized in writing marine hull insurance of the sailing vessels, of the wooden sailing vessels, which were there. Then came the nationalization of the general industry, insurance industry. And for reasons which uh, in, in most public sectors, it is believed that if anybody sits on a chair for three years, he becomes corrupt. So maybe that was the basis of risk of transferring people from one department to the other. And when this happened, there was dilution of expertise, domain expertise. So that situation has worsened today. And most of the general insurance, insur Indian general insurance industries, you hardly have any specialists with domain expertise because of the transfer from one department to the other. And this is one of the biggest challenges. The IRDA came in 2000 and privatization of the general industry insurance came in. And this was opened up to the public. Prior to the uh, privatization, there was a hull manual and a hull tariff. And it was very much regulated. For reasons best known, in the name of competition, this was thrown overboard. I won't say jettison because jettisons, jettison is always for the common good and there was no common good here. With the results that the rates today are one tenth of what they were in the tariff manual. So when the rates have hit rock bottom, where are the funds for, from which to pay a claim? And so the emphasis today is on how to repudiate any valid claim simply because there are no funds. So the root cause here is not collecting an adequate premium for the risk. So marine hull insurance today in present times is an unfortunate situation where ship owners want a lower and lower rate, ideally no deductible, and they, some of them are getting away with it. And with the result that when it comes to a claim, the answer is they don't get it. 
And that, I think, is a great concern. So what are the challenges? There is, you know, the, the concept, the principles and practices of marine insurance sometimes are so conspicuous by its absence that the IRDAI, which is the regulator, in, in their regulations, they say that proposal forms are not required for marine hull. Now, how, how on earth can an insurer ever do a risk assessment without a proposal form? So some fundamentals have been lost sight of. Now, as mentioned by Dr. Saxena, the Marine Insurance Act 1906 has been in a way amended by the Insurance Act of 2015. And we are talking about the English Act. And so some may wonder, why are you talking about the English Act when we have our own act of 1963? Well, the answer is, except for inland transit, all other policies, whether freight, whether hull, or whether cargo, are on institute clauses. And institute clauses are subject to English law and practice. So we are in a very queer situation that whilst the policy form says English law and practice, our own Indian Insurance Act of 1963 remains unamended. And that is where Captain Subedar has, has voiced his concern and has said that it's high time that we all put our heads together to bring about a change or to at least incorporate the provisions of the Insurance Act 2015 in the, to amend the 1963 Act. Insurance premiums the absence of guidelines and tariffs, which I mentioned, and the present rates, as I said, are in the region of 10% of what they were 20 years ago. Valuation issues. The IRDA is completely silent on licenses for valuers, but insurers insist that an IRDA surveyor has to give a valuation to Fernandez, uh, are you here? Uh, Mr. Fernandez, if you can hear me, you can try uh, logging out and again logging in. So I think there's some connectivity problem. Uh, I'm sorry, there seems to have been some technical glitch. Uh, so I think uh, Mr. Tony Fernandez seems to have logged out uh, maybe because of some connectivity problems. We're just trying to get back to him and request him to log in again.
Okay, I think uh, he's logging in. I'm just admitting him into the. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, I think we lost you for a minute. Uh, you yes, can again yes. resume your presentation. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, there was an internet uh, failure here. My apologies. I'm I'm resharing the screen. We were talking about uh, express warranties and the damsel sword when the when the internet uh, just suddenly vanished and I, I I apologize for that. Now warranty wordings were very clearly written and uh, in the in the Hull manual which is no longer present. So now if you read some of these wordings, they are absolutely not implementable, which means. It is one way of not paying a claim at all by including warranties which can't be implemented. And I'll give you examples of those in the next slide. The issue of an insurance policy, which is a contract of insurance, some of the wordings which I've seen clearly indicates that there is no quality check or quality control. I recently came across a marine hull policy for the towage of a vessel where the sum insured was three crores and the deductible was three crores, which means you will never ever get a claim. Now that was a typographical error apparently, but it happened due to two reasons. Number one, the figures were not, the, 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 the amount was only in figures and not in words. And secondly, nobody apparently checked this policy at all. Now what would have happened if there was a claim? The claim would have not been paid because there is a fear of audit among all, especially the public sector insurers, not to amend a policy and rectify a policy, even if it is wrong after a claim. So these challenges require to be addressed, which means in that case, neither the insurer nor the broker nor the assured had, had read the policy and it was discovered only when a risk management consultant pointed this out to them. There are some policy uh, aberrations, which are, as I said, fit for the book of Guinness Book of Records, you will never find a policy where the deductible is equal to the sum insured. Now, what is this damsel sword of express warranties in H&M policies? The first one is non-propel barges. There's an ISM and crew competency of barge and tug during the entire period of insurance. A non-propel barge is unmanned. The question of an IS, ISM being applicable does not arise. And the tug which tows it is on only for a period of tow. So how can the tug owner, the barge owner ensure that the tug, which is used only for a short period of time, has all the crew competency for the entire period of his policy, which means no claim can be paid. Sailing vessels not only an ISM warranty, they want a classification warranty during the entire period of, of their policy. And, and at least the Indian Register of Shipping does not class uh, wooden sailing vessels. Fishing vessels, the same. Yachts, the same. Uh, tug below 500 GT, ISM and towage approval. Tugs don't require towage approval simply because they are a tug. But the barge, which is non-propelled, requires a towage approval. So non-propelled barges, again, uh, crew competency. And ocean-going vessels, this, this, this takes the cake, to be moored and anchored in port during heavy weather. Now, this may seem uh, uh, fictitious. It is not. I have proof for all of this. What is the point? Is it a criticism? No, it's not. It's a wake-up call. When you get a policy and you don't read it and check it before a claim, you are definitely not going to get that claim. That's for sure. So, so what is the remedy? Is it that we just uh, try to be bemoan our losses and say that nothing can be done? Absolutely not. A lot can be done. What are the concerns as far as claims? Insurance intermediaries and service providers in India. Incidentally, the IRDAI, which is the regulator, 
does not differentiate between insurance intermediaries and insurance service providers. And use is a common name of insurance intermediaries, including service providers like surveyors. These regulations are silent. Uh, there are regulations for surveyors and loss assessors. And it is su surprising to know that once upon a time, master mariners, marine engineers, and naval engineers obtain licenses. Today, that's abolished completely. And you require, they, they require a BTEC in, in, uh, uh, in either naval architecture or mechanical engineering to survey a ship, which this guy perhaps has never sailed on or doesn't even have, have knows, uh, knows anything, whether in his uh, studies or in his experience. So licenses are just given without the absolute aspect of fundamental requirements of what a surveyor should do. So that's the big tragedy that we have today. Expectations of insurers. Insur some insurers say that my surveyor should not only be my eyes and ears, but they also should speak for us and they should do all the negotiations with the assured. Now, that is not the job of a surveyor because this is a contract between the insurer and the assured. And the surveyor is only to facilitate a, a survey independently. That is, the, the assured expects the surveyor to be fair, but unfortunately, that is not. Those surveyors who are fair eventually don't get work. This is all track record, and this is my experience over the last 43 years. The survey report, as far as Marine Hull is concerned, the you can say that the survey report, number of pages vary with the the amount of claim and the survey fees. The amount of unnecessary garbage which is put into a report makes it so confusing that nobody has the time in an insurance office to study it. They will only look at the last line and say, repudiate this claim, so fair enough. And what are the reasons? Lack of due diligence. Now just pull out words and phrases without any meaning. And unfortunately, there is no appellate authority Neither the IRDA nor any others are willing to look at it. The answer is go to court and get the claim with interest. Now, that is not utmost good faith. Now, there is a reason for all this. And we can't blame especially public sector insurers because they are under the damsel sword of audit queries and their provident fund and graduate. So there is a systemic problem here. Remove the fear and give authority to insurers to make decisions rather than to allow them to delegate it to surveyors and loss assessors. Last but not least, the average adjuster, general average, these two words are conspicuous by its absence in the IRDA regulations. According to which, as per the present IRDA regulations, a marine, I mean a surveyor, and he did not necessarily have a marine background, is also required to adjust a general average claim, although it doesn't say so, but by by implication, it means that the concept of general average and average adjusters is not there at all. There is no dispute resolution and prevention clause in marine health policies. That is also a very big lacuna. So action speaks louder than words. What's the use of talking all this? The pen is mightier than the sword. And if the sword is very short, then well, the pen is very sharp. However, just talking won't help. And so I have written uh, two articles in the BIMA Quest, which is a prestigious journal of the National Insurance Academy, one on regulations for surveyors need review and express warranties in, in marine policies, uh, highlighting all these challenges. Now let's briefly look at the case of the VLO Arun. The background of the vessel was this is a, was a 10-year-old vessel, twin screw vessel, a uh, very large crude carrier, uh, and uh, ore and oil and ore carrier. And she was considered a total loss, a constructive total loss, because one of her crankshafts on the starboard side had fractured, and she was in Singapore. She was stored to Alang. Oh, sorry, she came on her own par with one screw to Alang, and from Alang, she went on her own path to be beached. So the voyage from Singapore to India was without much of uh, problems. And the insurance of the funeral voyage was done by a local underwriter. And unfortunately, the vessel in, uh, 
the single screw broke down. The only engine which was there broke down. The vessel drifted, uh, went on rocks before she could go to the beaching plot. So there was a valid claim under the Allen missionary policy. Uh, surveyors and uh, average adjusters were appointed in this case by the support, by the underwriters. The statement of adjustment was given, despite which saying that the claim is payable, despite which the underwriters sent the file to a surveyor who said repudiate the claim. And uh, the matter went up before the Consumer Forum and the Honorable Supreme Court. And these, this is available on the internet. If you read these judgments, you can find what all that I have been said is condensed by the criticism of the insurers by the courts of law on how claims are settled. So very briefly, I would like to compare and contrast a ship upright and stable. As we all know, weight and buoyancy are there. There is an underkeel clearance. And all this because of the freeboard and the plimsoll mark. So you have reserve of buoyancy. Try to look at this, which means the ship is upright, positive stability. Compare and contrast this with insurance. The bottom line, then we have the marine insurance portfolio, which is risk and reserves. You have the freeboard as prudent underwriting and prudent claim settlements. Underside of keel and the, uh, uh, the underkeel clearance is the reward, which is the underwriting profits. So ideally, this should be the scenario. However, what happens is when there's instability, the ship goes upside down. There is buoyancy, but there is no stability. And what also happens is you can have a situation where the top line and the bottom line are, are, are such that the vessel is fine. She is, she is buoyant, but she is unstable. So which means it is unprofessional, but profitable. Now, ship apparently afloat, but actually aground. And when there are no underwriting profits, the vessel is aground. A ship apparently afloat, but actually aground and sunk in the mud is when there are underwriting losses. In the earlier cases, it was that there were no underwriting profits, but here you have underwriting losses. So is marine hull insurance in India afloat, uh, stable or unstable? You have to answer. Is it apparently afloat or firmly aground? And you know with underwriting losses where it could be. Every marine hull insurance portfolio has been underwriting losses. So the reason root cause being inadequate premiums, the consequence being non-payment of valid claims. So summary and conclusions, managing the risk of ships and lack of awareness, it starts with the ship owner. The ship owner has to do his duty. He has to analyze his own risks. He has to fill in a proposal form, even if a proposal form according to IRD is not required so that the risk can be assessed. He should tell the underwriters by the fair presentation of risk, disclose and represent everything less that be used against him. A prudent ship owner will always act as though uninsured to minimize the loss. And so should be a prudent insurer who should also do a risk assessment before insuring that vessel. The duty of disclosure and representation has been merged as the duty of fair presentation of risk in the Insurance Act 2015. Issues pertaining to ships in a volatile market, uh, container ships, for example, take a classic example, uh, the, the, because of the non-availability and the high freight rates, the values have gone eight to 10 times what they were a few months ago. So what does an insured do? What does an insured ship owner do? Does he insure it for 8 million or 80 million? And that's the question. What does the Marine Insurance Act say? The Marine Insurance Act says it should be it, it has defined insurable value. It does not state how that value is to be ascertained. So these are issues that have to be understood and tackled. Ideally, there should be a memorandum of agreement on valuation and claims matters at the time 
that the risk is placed with insurers. Last but not least, we have to unlearn, learn and relearn on a continuous professional basis so that there is always the aim to achieve win-win results. So thank you. And I'm very grateful for giving this opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you, brother. Uh, we have been agreeing on uh, for a while, and looking forward to you, to you towing us, towing us back into the water. Uh, good luck. We have you. brother uh, Subhash, who is an excellent pilot and also dedicated to marine hull, and we both normally share a same platform when we when we uh, teach ex, uh, when we share our thoughts with extra masters, and hopefully he would also assist me in the towage that you are talking about. Thank so you. Extra master has been aground for some time. I now call upon Captain Subhash Deshpande, uh, well-known expert and trainer uh, in the field of uh, education and in particular in investigation of casualties, etc. Uh, over to you, Subhash. I look forward to the boat to blame collision clause, uh, which is where uh, the marine insurance comes into hull and machinery, especially because there are no roads and no traffic signs at sea. And then, therefore, somebody has to take the blame, and it is more common to have both to blame collision clause, and that needs to be understood from Captain Deshpande. Over to you, sir. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. I think just ten to twelve. So, good afternoon or good morning. Okay. Uh, I want to say hello to Captain Barwe, whose uh, revalidation lectures I have heard quite a few times. Dr. Saxena, who, with whom I have shared many platforms of teaching, including extra chief engineers, uh, and I have always uh, learned quite a lot from these gentlemen. Also, Tony Fernandez, who is my friend, guide, and philosopher, as they say, two things which Tony did not say, which I'm going to tell you first, which he loves to say. Yeah? One is that the Manu Smruti, writes something about maritime law. It says, if you have a problem with law, go to a seafarer. Wow. So that means the seafarer had a lot of good practical legal knowledge. It means that, or we can conclude this from that. No, I don't know what context it was written. The second thing what he talked about just now, about a float and a ground was when and when he, whatever I'm going to tell you what he said, was in the context of an ONGC a vessel, which was brought into Mumbai Harbor. And she was already listing, the GM was very little, a medicine height, and, uh, and then she was given an anchorage, which was too shallow. Yes, and as the tide receded, in his words, Archimedes gave way to Darwin, oh, sorry, Newton. Archimedes gave way to Newton. So therefore, whatever buoyancy is equal to the mass of the ship, displacement is equal to mass of the ship was Archimedes, which now changed to Newton, where it's action and reaction. So the upthrust comes in and the ship capsized. So these two things I remember from Tony, and thank you very much, all of you, to be here with me and sharing this platform. I'll start my presentation if you allow me to share my screen. Yes, so here it is. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes, brother, you can. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, so in order to do this, uh, this uh, presentation session divided into two halves. One is a little bit about collision law. Dr. Saxena has told us about collision liability very briefly. He talked about it. Uh, so I would like to discuss the collision law part of the story where the marine insurance uh, indemnity is, is quite large with reference to the third party liability. Okay, so we'll discuss that, and then th this we did. We will discuss with the help of a case study of a ship called Tricolor and her collision, and then I would like to talk about 
the both to blame collision clause. Okay, so here is a collision. Yeah, here we have a bulk carrier hit by a gas carrier. Yeah, a few simple, simple seamanship things before we go on to the insurance part. I hope you notice that the ship is tied up here. The gas carrier after the collision is tied up here. Now I'm usually given to asking questions and I can't do that right now with you, but I hope some answers come into your minds. And in any case, whether they come or not, I want to give you the answer, which is that the ship remains in this position because the master has been trained not to withdraw suddenly from the collision, because if it does so, this ship, the other ship, which has been impacted in this area, might suddenly take in water from the sea in the whole part and might sink. So after the collision, the gas carrier does a sort of a, a reassessment of the risk to himself. And if they are okay, nothing is on fire, then the gas carrier should remain there and she should not just move about because of the waves and make the hole bigger. So we have tied it with the ropes. Yeah, okay. Here is a collision of a very interesting collision, very interesting picture. Of course, I got all these from the net. We have a Bernard Schulte ship, bulk carrier, uh, just riding on top of another bulk carrier. Very lucky that both are bulk carriers. And what else? Very lucky that the overriding, I would use that word overriding here, like the overriding uh, responsibility and authority of the master. We have an overriding Schulte ship on top of this. So the the Bernard ship, the Schulte ship was in ballast. And this is a very important point. And this one was loaded. So this is what happened. If she was also loaded, then probably the lower bulk carrier would be split into two for sure. You can see the extent to which she has come. Of course, that's through the air. When she comes through the metal, she doesn't come that much. And that is based on the naval architect's calculations of it's a mild collision or high density or high energy collision, et cetera. This is a, a this ship is a tanker, and here the collision has resulted in a fire, as you can see. Now the oil from the ship has sorry, the oil from the ship has come out, and this oil has caught fire on the water, as you can see, because the fire continued from the ship. So the immediately whatever salvage action was done was to spread foam in that area, in order to douse the fire. And then we had the tugs to uh, cool it down the area around and as well as the boundary cooling, as you can see, all right? So these are some of the situations of, I'd like to talk to you straight away and then I'll go back to the presentation. So these are some of the uh, nightmares which a ship owner can have legally and financially. And so does the master of the ship for sure. But let's consider the, obligations of the insurance, et cetera, in this forthcoming session with reference to this. The collision liability coming from here consists of the damage to the other ship, to the hull and machinery, damage to the cargo on the other ship. It can also be to other, if anybody gets if there is pollution from that ship, it might also land up with reference to pollution. That is the liability of a ship which has been blamed for the collision. Now there are international collision, like international convention, like the 1910 collision convention, which tells us how to divide the blame, right? Between ships. And of course there are very good scientific principles and legal principles related to collision law and the collision regulations, which are used to decide the amount of blame to each ship. For example, the collision that we saw for one ship might have been blamed 0%, which is very unlikely, and the other ship 100%, depending upon how the rules were followed and the records and everything. So therefore the ship owner's liability lies with reference to those percentages, which is called apportioning the blame. And generally, uh, the hull and machinery underwriter under an uh, ITC clauses policy would be ready to pay for this liability of his ship owner in addition 
to the loss or damage to his own ship. So we have an insurer who has, which has insured the Schulte ship. So he will pay for whatever damages to the Schulte ship, minus of course the deductible and so many other things are there, which we are not discussing with reference to that, number one. Number two, whatever, if at all the Schulte ship is found to be blamed, then the other bulk carrier, underwriting bulk carrier, whatever she claims to that extent, the ship owner will have, Schulte ship owner has to pay. And that is also covered by the Highland machinery underwriter of the Schulte ship as a liability. This is the RDC clause. Yeah. RDC, it in fact, yeah, running down clause, which is part of the ITC clauses mentioned by speakers here uh, uh, beforehand. So this in short is the thing. I'll go back to my presentation. Yes, can you see it, sir? Can you see the pictures again? Yes? Yes, brother, yes. Okay, so now the ship, in this case, you can see the nightmares of the ship owner. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the insurer to that extent, the insurer, I wouldn't say nightmares, but uh, the, whatever this thing he has to pay out. If you have a fire, the cargo can catch fire. Then we have damage to the cargo. Then we have the ship itself getting disabled. We might have loss of life or injury to people while trying to fight that fire. We have salvage involved here. As we can see the tug which, which will claim salvage and assistance to douse the fire. There might be a pollution issue. So many of these issues are perceptible and coming up in this case study, which I'm going to do with you. Okay. So here is the tricolor Kariba collision. I want to thank all the several websites and the French government report, investigation report, and other investigation and press report. There's a, there's a big uh, BBC report, which I have used also, from which I have secured the material, including photographs, et cetera, for the purpose of this educational PowerPoint presentation. Okay. So very interesting. Please note the name of the ship. The name of the ship is Tricolor. Yeah. And when I'm teaching to my students, I say, do you know that this was probably foreseen beforehand? Because this ship was involved in three collisions at the same time. Let's, let's talk about this first collision. As you can see this picture here, this happened in the English Channel. The Tricolor, which is a car carrier carrying luxury cars, yes. Dr. Uh, uh, Captain Dixit mentioned about the Felicity. This was even bigger than that. She carried 3,000 Volvos, BMWs, and Saabs, the tricolor. So she was a car carrier. She was proceeding in this direction. Everything is happening in the English Channel. The Kariba is a container ship, the big dadas of the traffic lanes of the world. So it's always going at a higher speed. So she's overtaking the tricolor. All this is happening in fog. There is deep fog, vessels can barely see each other. And there is a third ship. The ship is, ship's name is Clary. The Clary is proceeding in this way. Incidentally, please note, the Clary never contacted either Kariba or Tricolor. So therefore, but still is involved in the final apportionment of blame. And this is one very interesting thing I want uh, persons to note who are the audience to note in this case. Yeah, we will go into that a little later. In this case, just apparently, if you can see, the Kariba has no business to overtake the ship in fog. If she is, she has to keep well clear, not because of Rule 19, but in any case, the point is that Kariba saw that with reference to Clary, a collision might ensue in this area. Saw means what? On the radar detected on the radar. She could not see her, neither could Clary see her. It is Clary's normally duty, if, she's, if she detects the presence of another vessel forward of a beam, then to alter course to starboard. So the Clary should be altering course to starboard. All vessels should be giving fog signals uh, on the vessel. We don't know if they were doing that or not. That's not written in the investigation report. And the Clary's duty is to alter course to starboard. She did not do it fearing that the Kariba thinks that she has to take action because of as, as, a, as a ship, which is stand on ship, so-called stand on ship. And therefore she also has to take action and she 
alter course to starboard quickly. She's at a greater speed and hits the tricolor. The tricolor sinks, and this in short is the collision. So we had two ships involved in the collision, tricolor and Kariba. The Clary just kept going, and then later on was told to anchor. That's another part. So the Norwegian flag Williamson Lines own vehicle carrier got involved in three collisions in English Channel within a fortnight, resulting in the tricolor loss, $40 million. Probably the Holland machinery insurer paid all of it. All of it means minus whatever uh, requires to be deducted. And marine pollution, P&I Club came into the picture. There was pollution here. And probably the biggest loss in auto exporting industry, uh, which was paid uh, by the cargo insurers, of course, and the P&I clubs on behalf of ship owners because of what I'm about to tell you about boat to blame collision clause. And the cargo value was about 49 million. That's more than the ship value, 49 million because of luxury cars. December 14, 2002 in thick fog, bound from Zeebrugge to Southampton, the tricolor with a load of 3000 BMWs, Volvos and Sops, collided with a Bahamian, Bahamian flag container ship named Kariba, about 20 miles north of the French coast. So therefore, from the beginning, the French Coast Guard, et cetera, were involved in this collision, also to safeguarding the wreck, et cetera. Okay. The Kariba sustained heavy damage above the waterline, but could continue back to Antwerp under escort. And the tricolor remained on her side in 30 meters of deep water. That's the Kariba. So she continued on her voyage because she was not materially damaged, mostly above the water level. So she continued back to Antwerp, her destined, her departure port in order for repairs, et cetera. That's Kariba. So there was no loss of life or anything like that. No cargo on the Kariba was damaged. Now state of the tricolor after the collision. So that's how the tricolor was after the collision, lying on her side, probably had very little GM at the time she was hit. Uh, but that story is not very clear reading from the <clears throat> investigation reports. And the status of 3000 BMWs, Volvos and Saabs. Yeah, so you can say the entire cargo is almost immediately lost. This is a close-up picture taken by the salvers after the hull was cut into nine pieces by the salvers. Salvers again were Smith Tuck, uh, the same salver which was earlier discussed. Danger marking boys with lights. Now we have a wreck right in the middle of a busy channel, right? Other ships can hit it. So what did the French government and the British government do? They put up a lot of uh, navigational boys. They put radar, radar beacons, which are icons around it. And of course, radio navigational warnings. And there was a barge and two uh, police vessels guarding and talking, uh, sorry, uh, flashing lights, et cetera, to all those who pass. And there, of course, radar transponders were fitted. This protection was almost foolproof, but no, fools are ingenious. Just two days later, a cargo ship Nicola, followed by another vessel tanker Vicky, carrying 70,000 tons of gas oil, crashed into the tricolor on January 1, 2003, after failing to listen to several warnings which were given. So, fools are ingenious. Salvage wreck removal work was assigned to the Dutch salver Smith. Sorry. Yeah. And all pumpable bunker oil from tricolor was re recovered. Yeah. There was, this is, of course, the salver job. There was pollution due to tuck contact with the tricolor's bunker tank. And also, when the wiki collided with tricolor from wiki's bunker tanks, salvers took three months to split the tricolor into nine sections. And all this was removed from the place. Here are the legal aspects. In June 2003, the owner of the Kariba filed a complaint in the Southern District of New York. So this is forum shopping guys. Okay. The New York has its own nice laws, uh, or rather United States, uh, which, are, um, which are sometimes favorable to those who are seeking refuge there with reference to forum shopping, as I said. So the Kariba filed in the New York court seeking exoneration from liability from all this, as well as limitation of its own liability, which is again coming under the LLMC convention related to the gross tonnage of the Kariba. The cargo owners from Tricolor, remember the, all the cargo on Tricolor was lost. They filed claims for lost or damaged cargo. 
Meanwhile, the Kariba implemented the Clary and the tricolor as third party dependents. Look, if Kariba files against the tricolor only, yeah, or, or, or Kariba has to pay all that, then Kariba's this thing, so they implemented Clary as well, so that they will also be paying part of that. Therefore, Clary was implemented, although it did not collide. And the tricolor itself should be found to be blame at blame for something or the other. This was the pleading. The tricolor and Kariba agreed to resolve their dispute against each other in Belgium. All parties agreed to substantive law governing this case derived from these treaties ratified by Wessel's flag state. And mainly, sorry, mainly these, uh, this substantive law considered Colrex, which is of course agreed by both all the nations and the 1910 collision convention that I talked, talked about, where the, uh, the loss or damage to either ship is paid according to the proportion of blame which each ship will be uh, assigned with. And that happens after some time. The judge ruled that the Kariba was 100% liable for the accident. Both Kariba ship owner and the tricolor cargo interest appealed to the US Court of Appeals. Obviously, the Kariba ship owner wouldn't take this. So he wants other ships also to be involved, contesting that Kariba's fault was not the sole cause of the collision. Findings of the appellate court, so they went to appellate court, were published in July 2007. Apportionment of blame. The judge assigned the apportionment of blame and share liability as follows. The tricolor, 17%. Clary. 20% and Kariba, 63%. So the main blame was to Kariba. So they would be paying to each other in this proportion to, for the loss of the tricolor, including the cargo damage. Now, obviously their own, who will pay on the behalf of the shipper is the ship owner, which is liable, who will pay on behalf of the ship owner, but that's where the insurers come into the picture. How is Clary made liable is my question. Uh, Clary did not even contact either of the ships. She did not collide at all. So here is a point for you. Article 13 of 1910 Collision Convention says, this convention extends to the making good of damages when a vessel has caused to another vessel or to goods of persons on board either vessel, either by the execution or non-execution of a maneuver or by the non-observance of the regulation, even if no collision has actually taken place. So all mariners, uh, uh, master's chief, chief houses, if there are any, please note this very important point. I got away with it, I didn't go light, doesn't mean that you cannot be blamed. And, and therefore the clary without touching them should have altered course to starboard. It did not. This was considered very nicely. And that's why I like this case very much, was blamed 20%. Huh? The claims and insurance aspects, the trical and Kariba loss or damage to hull of each other, that's collision liability, the RDC running down clause, clause of the hull and machinery insurer. This can be three-fourth or uh, um, uh, usually the three-fourth liability comes in ITC hulls 11083. Yeah, and accordingly, three fourth of that the Highland machinery under at we would pay, and one fourth would be paid by the PNI club. Cargo on tricolor and others. Now we're talking about cargo. Loss of cargo, collision liability, both to blame PNI clubs and Highland machinery. Uh, just some interesting things French and British governments who mark the wreck and petrol and all that kharcha, all that expense they will be claiming. And the ship owner of the particular wreck will have to pay it. I would return here Nairobi Convention, which came into force in 2015. But earlier also under LLMC, the ship owner of the tricolor would be obliged to pay to both these governments for marking the wreck and warning ships and all that. That's his duty. And his PNI club will pay up for that. The rescue tug and the Kariba, there were some people in the water when the tricolor sank. They did some search and rescue, and they, they were the tug was diverted. Where would he get his money from? So salvage convention to some extent and some gratis by pandemigators only it was not uh, property property salvage it was only life salvage sometimes the pnd club gives a gratis amount for that environmental agencies and claimants as we heard in a very good lecture on ipc fund today uh, there would be a lot of claims birds beaches cleanup the llmc would be there why i'm saying llmc anybody uh, of course, you can't answer the question. LLMC comes into the picture because at that time, the bunker convention was not in existence. 
2002. It came into force in 2008. That's why I written LLMC there. For tankers, no problem. Wiki was a tanker. Wiki's oil would come under CLC. And of course, the fund convention, if it exceeds that. And now I've written the bunker convention. Yeah, P and I club, I would pay the salva, bunker removal plus rec removal, etc. So these are the claims and insurance aspects. Yeah. Under ITC Hulls 11083, will Clary's Hull and Machinery insurer pay up? That's my question. So the Clary, which did not collide at all, his Hull and Machinery insurance will contain this three-fourth collision liability clause. Will the insurer pay up under that? So this is the, I have reproduced the clause here. Just look at the last line of that clause. So the insurer is supposed to pay general average, salvage, salvage under contract or any such vessel or property, including the cargo, where such payment where assured is and the consequences of the vessel hereby insured coming into collision with any other vessel. So here the h &M will not pay the Clary's liability to Tricolor. Why it will not pay because <clears throat> of this particular clause. Who will then pay? It will be the protection and indemnity club of the Clary because it would be a non-contact damage. So non-contact damage like the wash damage, for example, you pass too close to a ship and cause damage to that ship is, is it will not be it will be paid by the P and I club. Okay. Now going to this boat to blame collision clause. This is a little bit intricate thing. There are a lot of things which I'm avoiding to tell you. They come, uh, I mean, all the details, it's impossible to clarify. Uh, so therefore I shortened it. Let me see how much I can convey to you. I suggest to those who are interested to write down the names of whatever I'm putting like charter party, et cetera, and then to check up on, on their own. So boat to blame collision clause, in this collision case study, now assume the one we saw, blame for collision proved to be Kariba 80%. I'm changing the figures for simplicity, okay? Blame for collision proved to be Kariba 80% and tricolor 20%. Let us ignore Clary for simplicity, just for the uh, understanding of this clause. Liabilities to each other include loss or damage to hull, to cargo, and to injury claims. Kariba, therefore, has to pay 80% of Tricolor's claim of hull, cargo, and injury claims. Only Tricolor's cargo suffered loss or damage due to collision. Kariba's cargo did not suffer. Clary's cargo did not suffer. So in this collision, only Tricolor's cargo suffered. And my word, so heavily, about 49 million as we saw the value. Now, the Tricolor's cargo owners will be obliged to recoup that. They have their own insurer. Let's see what I got here. Tricolor's, Tricolor's cargo interest cannot claim this claim for this from the carrier ship, which is the Tricolor ship owner, because of immunities under the Higbisby rules, which is a which is uh, included in the bill of lading. So under the contract of carriage, they have the immunities, and because of that immunity, the Tricolor's cargo owners cannot claim from the Tricolor itself, which is a carrier ship, and that is as per the contract evidenced by. Bill of lading. So this is contract law. Here onwards, we will look only at cargo loss or damage. The tricolor's cargo interest, however, can claim this from the non-carrying ship, Kariba. So the tricolor's cargo is now claiming from the ship Kariba. The Kariba ship owner thus is liable to pay for tricolor's cargo claim, assume claim to be $10 million. Kariba is liable to, within its own proportion, that is 80% of this claim. Yeah, his, his blame is 80%. So he will, the Kariba is supposed to pay $8 million. Up to here is international law. Do not consider insurance here. Just the ship owner is support, is liable to pay this to Karib, uh, to Trical. Now we go to US law. Remember, this is where the New York court has been referred to for this by Kariba. So under US law, after paying $8 million, Kariba can claim this back from Tricolor as part of its own loss, which means Kariba will claim and Tricolor is liable to pay what is Tricolor's own percentage of blame? 20%. So Tricolor is obliged to pay 20% of these 8 million, which is 1.6 million. Just, just taking it back again, 80% and 20%. Total claim, 10 million. Kariba pays to Tricolor, 8 million. Yes. Now, under US law, Kariba can claim this back to the extent of the tricolor's proportion. 
So 20% of 8 million, it can claim it back. When all this is ship owner's liabilities, yeah, 1.6 million. Additional factor was that under US law until 1975, ship Kariba would have to pay 100% of the tricolor's cargo claim because the USA had not ratified the 1910 Brussels Convention. They still have not, but at least they've included that in their customary international law. Ship owner of tricolor- Can you please conclude? Yes. Ship owner of tricolor thus becomes liable for loss or damage of cargo carried on his ship. In this case, 1.6 million. And to avoid such an eventuality, solution is to include both to blame clause. So you can see now tricolor still ends up by paying 1.6 million. Uh, so this is the both to blame. Uh, both, both are to be blamed. And for that, a clause of both to blame is put into the bill of lading. Yeah. Then with that clause, the tricolor can claim this back from his own cargo interest. So tricolor's own cargo interest have to pay 1.6 million back to the tricolor's owner. And therefore, the, what is the this thing for that? BIMCO's, so people can write down this, BIMCO's boat to blame collision clause, which is included with a bill of lading so that the ship owner, like, like the uh, tricolor, can claim it back from his cargo owner. And of course, the Shell Time 4 Time Charter Party also has such a clause there. So you can check up the any time charter party. And of course, finally, Institute Cargo Clauses A, B, and C, where the cargo insurer who is actually paying to the tricolor for uh, to the tricolor's cargo owners, 49 million or whatever, yeah, goes by subrogation, goes after this and then claims that 8 million from there, and then is obliged to pay back 1.6 million. That is what is contained in these cargo clauses. So therefore, thank you. That's the end of that, of uh, the presentation. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to put this across to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain Deshpande. Thank you very much for a very lucid explanation of a very complex issue of both to blame collision clause, uh, which is, uh, not yet resolved in many many disputes that are pending before the insurance companies. Uh, now let's me bring the cargo interest into the picture, and we have a practitioner, Mr. Balasundaram, to give us his view on cargo claims and the way forward. Over to you, Mr. Bala. Thank you. Good afternoon to all, and. Uh, I thank IMF for giving me this opportunity. Uh, but a, a, some, a humble request, please do not change the batting order midway because you know it doesn't really work. I was supposed to present at 11 o'clock and I had planned my day accordingly. So this sudden change you know, has upset my schedule a little and delay is not covered under any marine cargo policy. So anyway, that being that. So now let us set the ball rolling. So will you share my presentation on screen, please? Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, so when I was called to talk about marine cargo to possible cadets from institutes, marine institutes, I thought, what am I going to speak about? Because essentially here, the emphasis would be on hull and machinery, liabilities, etc. And cargo would take a very, I would say, a backseat. I thought so. So, that, so I kept my presentation very, very basic. Uh, is that I kept it so very simple that it may appear to be ABC to some of you, but at the same time, uh, I want people to know what cargo insurance. We are not going to. I, I, my presentation will be devoid of technical jargon. I try to keep it as simple as possible. So the first thing which I would like to. So you will operate the screen, or do I? Oh, I'll have to operate, sir, because the, yeah, yeah, please, I'm sharing please, the, please, please. you can let me know when you want to change the slide. Yeah, yeah you can change the screen now. You need to change. Okay. So the first question which I'm asking the audience is, who is responsible for safe transportation of cargo from one place to another? First of all, let's get the basics right. When a vessel moves from port A to port B and she's laden with containers or even bulk cargo, who is responsible for safely carrying the cargo from point A to point B? Make no mistake about it, it is the carrier who issues the contract of a freight mill, which in this case would be the bill of lading, who is solely and wholly responsible for safe carriage. 
because he charges freight for it and it is a legally binding contract he has to discharge the cargo carry the cargo safely and discharge it at the other point is that clear and this applies to any carriage be it a road transit or be it the airway transit anything in all cases the carrier is primarily responsible for safety of the cargo and we should get this point clear so if that be the case the question would arise why should there be something called a marine cargo insurance at all and now or not before that let me step back a little and say that we talked about marine insurance marine insurance is so vast and we are all still learning every day it's a ocean in itself and it has got so many branches like your marine hull and machinery your protection and indemnity then you have marine cargo insurance and you have uh, associated liabilities also like you have the terminal operators liabilities you have stevedores liabilities you have freight services liabilities so the term marine insurance is too simplistic so my discussion with you guys today is going to be on marine cargo insurance for which we saw the first slide and said that if the carrier is going to be uh, responsible for safe carriage from point a to point b where is the need for a cargo insurance why would anybody buy cargo insurance i transport cargo through your vessel and there is a damage i will straight away claim from the vessel owner and the vessel owner would pay it is that that simple it's not as we'll see in the next slide please so why buy cargo insurance then there are limitations in recovery from the vessel first one is the cause of loss or damage a negligence on part of the carrier or other third parties we omit for the time being needs to be established so any loss a marine cargo insurance subject to its policy terms and conditions would pay the loss without asking the question about who was negligent whereas a ship owner would pay up only if it is established that he has been negligent in his duties in whatever is assigned duties what is supposed to do which is again laid down in the various conventions second point is could be a very long drawn procedure to recover from a ship one may say that yes it is equally difficult to recover from insurance companies especially the government insurance companies but relatively establishment of negligence and then getting a claim out of a shipping company would be far more cumbersome than recovery under a cargo policy the third point which is there which facilitates or which requires the marine cargo insurance to be in place is that yes as we said very simply in the first slide the ship owner is responsible for safe carriage and delivery but at the same time his liabilities are governed by the conventions to which the bill of lading is subject to it could be the hague rules it could be the rotterdam rules or the hague bisbee rules or the hamburg rules which clearly spell out when the carrier would be liable and also what could be his maximum liability per unit of cargo so the maximum liability which is foisted on the carrier may well be below the actual amount of loss so this is another incentive why one should buy marine cargo insurance not rely on recovering from uh the um, uh, ship owners alone and last but not the least these conventions which we talked about also say cite out the circumstances when the cargo owner when the vessel owner will not be liable to pay so even as we see it this is the basic part which i want to say theory and i would be just talking about four practical cases which i have been involved in in a very simple manner without getting into technicalities which show the different circumstances under which a ship owner becomes liable does not become liable and things like that when there is an insurance policy when there is no insurance policy so these four cases we would see please next slide please so when we talk about recoveries basic basically what we are talking about is if there is a loss or damage it has to be recovered from somebody okay 
If it is not insured, you need to recover it from any third party who is in the supply chain. It could be the carrier, it could be at the port, it could be the warehouse keepers who are there in the ordinary course of transit where goods are kept there. It could be stevedores, it could be container freight stations, logistics providers, many of them are there. But we confine ourselves to carriers and more precisely, ocean carriers. Next slide, please. Okay, now, though there are minor differences in the different conventions to which BLs are subject to, by and large, if you see the duties of a ship owner, what he is supposed to do is lay down in this broad four formats. One, carrier has to make the ship seaworthy. So that is his responsibility. He should properly man, equip, and supply the ship. And of course, make the holds, cleaning chamber, or cooling chambers, etc., clean for holding the cargo. And Okay, receive, load, handle, store, carry, keep, unload, and deliver the goods. This is very, very simplistically stated. Though each one would be subject to discussion, debate, arguments. As long as a carrier does all these four, and despite this, there is going to be a loss or damage, he gets exonerated from that. That's, that's what the broad understanding here is. In reality, things vary a little, uh, but these are the duties cast on the carrier, the shipping company. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now, under the various conventions, I'm not getting into which is what. Broadly, the perils which cause a loss or damage to the cargo for which the ocean carrier will not be liable, fire, unless caused by his fault or privity of the carrier, act of war, act of war, even dangers of the sea, act of public enemies, negligent, neglect of the master crew, navigation, management, etc. blah, blah, blah. And this is not exhaustive as I have said. So, tie up with the second slide of us, which we saw, that even though the carrier is basically responsible for safe carriage from point A to point B, there are enough I would not say no phones, enough protection given to him also so that he is not foisted with all the liability for cargo damages or losses. So if it happens due to any of these reasons, the cargo owner, could, the vessel owner could well say that I am not liable. But can the insurance company, if the cargo is insured, say so? No. They can say so only if the damped peril is not covered under the policy, not otherwise. So the question of negligence does not apply to a in cargo insurance policy. So it is better we buy a cargo insurance policy. Okay. Next slide, please. So, so if you look at it from the standpoint of an exporter or an importer, whether he is insured or whether he is not insured, it is incumbent that he protects his recovery rights against care. So here again, as a carrier, what we need to do is also to be seen. So if there, is, if there is an apprehension that there is going to be a loss, a joint survey is the first important thing which happens and followed with the notice of loss to the shipping company. Subsequently, you supply the relevant documents, the invoice, the bill, the packing list, country of origin, etc. to the shipping company, lodging a monetary claim, a formal claim saying that you owe me this amount of money. The claim is to be lodged. And this happens within the specified time. It needs to happen within the timelines. The timeline separately are given. One, for lodging this claim. And secondly, even after lodging the claim, if there is no redressal, or filing a suit against the shipping company. So these are two different things. And the timelines are specified just for the sake of uh, clarity. In the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So these are the time when you see the steamer company, the application should be done within, or a joint survey should be done within three days from date of discharge of the car. And notice of claim, one year. And the date time for filing a suit is also one year. So sometimes what happens is, tricky situations emerge. The cargo is insured. There is an insurance policy covering it. But, and the claim has been lodged against the shipping company also for protection of recovery rights, which I'll come to later. 
but the period of one year is allowed about to elapse and still the claim is not settled so what happens tomorrow the insurance company declines the claim the insured should have a recourse against the shipping company so many a time what happens is they file a suit against the shipping company and if the insurer settles the claim subsequently he joins the suit under subrogation so now we get into the four cases which i wanted to briefly discuss with you just let's let's go to the first next slide please okay this was a case where i was involved there was fire on board a vessel causing damages to the cargo okay recovery rights were duly protected that is within the timelines notice was given everything was done there was a cargo insurance also and cargo insurer settled the claim and he got a letter of subrogation from the claimant and proceeded against the shipping company for recovery in fact i was the cargo insurer i can say so we proceeded against the shipping company for recovery so so the recovery can come from both cases one directly from the exporter or importer or the owner of the cargo as i must say if he has not insured his cargo or even if he has insured the cargo if the cargo insurer settles the claim and then under the right of subrogation he proceeds against the shipping company for recovery so the shipping company's liability extends even after the uh, cargo claim has been settled so coming back to this case uh, there was a fire and recovery rights were pursued cargo claim got settled and uh, the shipping company was proceeded against for recovery shipping company quoted the terms under the hague whiskey rules and said that obviously as a shipping company we need to take a defense every time to say that we have not been negligent and whatever duties passed on us by these conventions we have done it so they took the plea saying that the fire was not to be due to their negligence and hence they were not liable to pay anything so amount was quite large so as insurer were also not willing to let go so he said i am going to file a suit now time frame was there so this is we are going to file a suit jointly against you so then came the problem see now this is not theory this is practice the insure the car the vessel owner had a 50 50 chance of winning the suit also insurer also had a 50 50 chance of winning so both the insurer the vessel owner claimed that he was not negligent it had to be established by the insurer it would be a long drawn process considering the high litigation cost shipping company said let's have a compromise settlement so this is what a practical situation is so maybe the amount was not the full amount paid as a claim but then there was a compromise settlement for the satisfaction of both parties this is the first piece now we go to the second piece now here was a straightforward case here what happened is a machine in completely knockdown condition was sent in a container and was being unloaded using the vessel steric the wire snapped the container fell down and the cargo was damaged at the port at the discharge port shipping company immediately on their own volition they organized a joint survey and the findings were all recorded consignment was insured so the cargo insurer settled the claim and proceeded against the shipping company okay here again there was a cargo insurance in place and um, it was payable so they paid the claim they proceeded against the shipping company and here there was no issue at all shipping company paid up and did not challenge the liability of the now they are 100% sure that any which ways we have been negligent or something yes so they paid up so this is another different case a third case which i saw was okay now here there was a so i want to highlight this aspect specifically container with imported cargo was received at the dispot apparently good condition no signs of damage it was moved to the cfs cleared and then sent to the final england destination which was miles away it carried wooden furniture and on opening up it was found that the furniture suffered in extensive damage fortunately in this case there was an insurance policy which covered the consignment not only till the discharge port but till the final inland destination 
So the insurer had no way of escaping liability. They did pay the claim. But then they took a position that my rights of subrogation are rights of subrogation are there, but my recovery rights against the shipping company are prejudiced because you have not sent them a notice or you have not lodged a monetary claim on them and all that stuff. And so we are deducting 15% of the claim amount. This is a very standard practice of insurers. So in this case, it was not at all justified because when the container landed at the disco, there was no extensive sign of damages. Had there been some indication of damages, a joint survey would have been uh, organized and possibly the shipping company would have had their say also. One. Second point is, it is not clear whether the damages happened during the long ocean voyage or during the inland transit voyage. So that is also not known because the damage was discovered at the final destination. So the point to be noted here is that every marine loss, marine cargo loss or a claim need not have a recovery against the shipping company. Okay, and as we said, even if there is a recovery, there could be the recovery could the claim could be either from the insured himself, or the, that is the cargo owner himself, or the insurance company under subrogation. Let's go to the last case, which is different from this one. Uh, this was a very interesting case. A consignment of perishables was sent from India to Canada. Now what happened is it was destined for Montreal port, but since there was some adverse weather, snow, etc., the vessel was diverted to another smaller port, and then they moved it by rail to Montreal. Okay, so what happened? There was delay, and subsequent and further, further, the railway wagons did not have refrigerating equipment. The cargo got spoiled since it was perishable. It was fruits and veggies. Fruits it was primary. So, in short, the client did have a policy. He had a marine cargo policy, and that cargo policy also had a condition that they would pay for losses arising due to failure of refrigeration, provided there is a breakdown to the refrigerating machinery lasting 12 hours or more. In this case, if you see, there was no question of a breakdown of the refrigerating machine. The issues here are different. So the vessel went to a different port because of conditions beyond everybody's control. And from there, still it was under the bill of lading. The vessel company moved it by rail to reach the final destination they forwarded it. And yet, you know, so... And the railway wagons did not have the cooling equipment. So there was no question of breakdown of refrigerating equipment and lasting more than 12 hours, which was a condition of the policy for a claim to be paid. So when the claim was lodged on the insurance company, the insurance company showed us this condition and said, boss, your claim is not going to be paid because this exclusion is very, this condition is very clear. There has been no breakdown to any refrigerating equipment. Neither has there been a continuous period of 12 hours. So the breakdown itself is not there. So the question of 12 hours does not apply. So sorry, I am not going to pay the claim. But did this exonerate the ship owner from liability? No. Because it was their negligence. It was informed to them that it was temperature controlled cargo and it had to be carried at a prescribed temperature, which under the circumstances, they could not manage that refrigeration in the railway wagon space. And also there was this delay which took place. So the shipping company admitted life and settled the claim directly to the cargo. So it was not in full. They offered and it was a negotiated settlement. So the point is liabilities can come to the shipping company on cargo directly from the cargo owner or from the insurance company after settlement of claim also. So I think that brings us to the end of the presentation. So uh, I would only say in conclusion that ensuring that 
cargo interests are also taken care of and institutions educational institutions tell seafarers about the need in taking care what are the precautions they need to take as far as cargo is concerned what are the liabilities which can come to them so you see recovery is a vital part of cargo claims recoveries but recovery rights need to be protected but again as i said in all cases there need not be a recovery for the insurer we gave that example of the furniture because most losses happen on a discovered basis and as a shipping company we need to fight to the nail to establish that we have not been negligent in our duties and we are not liable having said that a cost benefit analysis needs to be done about winability should the case go to court and the legal expenses involved which could be quite mammoth in some cases and the last but not the least is the case that where there could be instances where there are limitations in the cargo insurance policy the cargo insurance policy may not pay that does not mean the ship owner is also absolved of liability these are two different contracts the basic duty for safe carriage from point a to point b rests with the ocean carrier that's it so thank you for your time and if you have any questions subsequently we can take it uh, that's all i have to say thank you thank you bala thank you very much uh, sorry for uh, the change of uh, uh, sequence uh, i i thought to bring in the collision together with uh, tony's uh, presentation uh, so that the cargo interest uh, is not lost between the two presentations uh, thank you very much again uh, for highlighting that carrying cargo from a to b the liability uh, is with the shipping uh, line and needs to be uh, well thought of and protected uh, even if it is discovered later on uh, with that uh, i have uh, one or two questions which have come on the chat box i would like uh, one of the panelists uh, perhaps uh, dr saxena uh, to answer to what what is the difference between the present act and the 2015 act as far as the term good faith is concerned uh, dr saxena would you like to uh, give a small uh, answer to that yeah i'll i'll give that up. i'll give that uh, you see now in the in the in the amendments or in the new uh, 2015 act uh, what has come is that there is a requirement of fair representation okay now fair representation is to be given by the uh, insured before he is uh, uh, he is uh, uh, buying the insurance okay now he something like uh, at most good faith he is supposed to tell the material facts etc etc and uh, the insured on his part should be i mean so there is a, there is a some uh, some onus on him also that if he feels that uh, there is uh, some more information required he is supposed to raise the uh, you know. i'll i'll give uh, with, the, with the actual case uh, this example uh, there was a yacht uh, which was insured for 13 uh, million euros okay uh, and uh, this uh, yacht became a total loss okay and uh, it was established that uh, when this insurance was taken that time the yacht owner had already got a, a, a valuation done and the valuation was of 7 million euros uh, okay and he had advertised the sale of this at 8 million euros now when this information came to to be known to the hull underwriters they said that this is a breach of the fair representation okay uh, as per the earlier mechanism of utmost good faith the question does not arise you know that there will be no but now under the new mechanism there are two possibilities that whether this breach is reckless or intentional or it is a mistake 
okay if it is a intentional or reckless uh, the contract can be avoided and uh, the premium can be kept by the insurance company okay in case of mistake he has a choice if he wants he can avoid but alternatively there is a mechanism and when this particular case went to the court the the judgment was given in this favor that this mistake was uh, not uh, reckless not intentional on part of the on the ship owner and therefore uh, there is a formula given that if you knew about this presentation uh, about this uh, material fact what premium would have you what premium you would have charged so suppose you would have charged x now what have you charged now uh, we have charged y so now the claim can be proportionately reduced okay so there is a mechanism where uh, the claims can still be paid and it is not like the earlier time where the contract could be avoided okay i hope this I mean, in a very quick way i have tried to uh, simplify this thank you dr saxena that's a fairly good example of fair representation vis a vis uber and my fine good faith uh, the idea is that in terms of technology and developments and communication uh, the idea of utmost good faith as the only uh, as the only element is reduced uh, for overall benefit uh, my next question is perhaps to bala uh, is it possible to recover anything from uh, delay in delivery of cargo Uh, sir, I think uh, he uh, seems to have uh, I don't know got disconnected. Uh, he doesn't seem to be on the list of participants at the moment. Uh, we can just request him again to log in. Okay, uh, I I I I'll give him a call. Uh, that was a, that. Uh, anybody else would want to touch upon until Bala comes back? No, usually delays are not covered. Usually delays are not covered. I would have thought so. Delay a delay in delivery of cargo is generally. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Ajay, go ahead. Dr. Saxena, mine is specifically with, uh, you know, respect to your presentation on Ever Given. Now, Ever Given, all the cargo was stuck there and, you know, the whole delay was over a month that the cargo reached their uh, the destination because of all the complications that you gave the date lines. So, uh, can the um, owner of the cargo who has insured the cargo for delivery by so-and-so date because that's the contract. Now that contract has been breached. So can't he claim damages on that? That is what my question was. Basically, that, that the delay that, you know, eventually because it may be crucial parts for some other forward thing, you know, therefore the question. Yeah, I uh, don't know. Okay, now I understand. Uh, you see, under the cargo insurance, it will not be covered. But there is a possibility that under tort, uh, the cargo owner can always, if they demonstrate, if they demonstrate that uh, the, the ship owner had a, a duty of care uh, towards him. The duty was breached, and because of the duty of uh, the breach in duty, uh, they suffered uh, loss. That means they have to demonstrate that they have suffered consequential loss. Okay, so in such cases, they can uh, definitely try to claim from the uh, from the ship owner or from the from the carrier, but not under the from the cargo underwriters. No. Not, not to my knowledge. I don't think so. No. So there is a remedy available. There is a remedy available, but not against the cargo underwriters. Uh, ADG, a question for you. Uh, why was uh, the tanker, in spite of all these provisions, arrested in Ennore? Sir, I already replied that on the chat box that I, I was making a limited point with respect to the scope for compensation available under funds convention because it was a spill although like msc chitra and luck care every says it's a bunker spill but fund allows a bunker spill for tanker and that was not explored that was limited point i was making as far as the arrest of other parts i am not a right person to talk about it because coast guard doesn't get into accident investigation or uh, we are involved in those aspects so i can't comment on that okay when we have some uh, if you can share uh, a view on that uh, between me and you or yourself on the email, uh, maybe we can uh, express some opinion 
or uh, critically examine the issue in the next uh, magazine of the IMF. Uh, Captain Deshpande, is it possible for you to comment in, in uh, absence of Bala, what may be the status of multimodal transport insurance? No, I think, um, I think uh, Saxena sir only should be answering multimodal transport part. But if I can just go to the other question uh, briefly in 30 seconds, the ship is likely to be arrested under Merchant Shipping Act for any violation of pollution laws on the Indian coast under the Merchant Shipping Act. So that's a different thing why the tanker was arrested. Uh, first, the arrest would come whether the conventions are applicable, whether ratified by India or not. The, the DGS would look into, or the Indian government would look into the arrest of ship in order to recover any uh, claims, etc., for the cleanup and other things. That the government would do in any case, despite having all the mechanisms in place if required. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Can I come in for that multimodal? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you see, uh, there are two aspects here. See, cargo insurance uh, is is uh, from the seller's warehouse to the buyer's warehouse. Okay, seller's factory to buyer. Okay, uh, it is not limited to only the sea leg. Okay, right from transportation by train, by truck, by ship, till it reaches. So that is the cargo insurance part. Okay, so but one important thing is when a, when a cargo is given to a multimodal uh, transport operator, uh, let's say in ICD Ludhiana, he issues the bill of lading there, okay, uh, say Mustline. And therefore, Mustline takes the responsibility of carrying that container right from ICD Ludhiana, uh, uh, right up to somewhere in interior of uh, US. Okay. Now, in between, the cargo may be handled by, by truck, by train, by ICD owner, by terminals, by ships, you know, there are so many entities which are involved. Now, if the cargo gets damaged, uh, obviously the consignee or the receiver of the cargo is going to claim from bus line because they are the ones who have given the bill of lading or they will claim from him, their insurance company. But let's keep to, uh, to the uh, multimodal transport operator. Uh, now, Obviously, under the terms of uh, Multimodal Transportation Act, if it is liable, that, then the MERS line would pay. But subsequently, MERS line could claim from any of these people who are there in the transportation chain. So in other words, the exposure of liability is to the ICD owner also, to a truck company also, to a train company also, etc., etc. And for all of them, there is a, there is a special club called TT Club where this kind of a product is available and uh, where they can ensure their liabilities. Okay. So cargo insurance is right from uh, seller to buyer and uh, liability in between wherever the liability rests. I hope that uh, signifies. Thank you, Dr. Saxena. Uh, that gives me uh, uh, time to thank all the speakers and the audience for giving us a little more time. Uh, that uh, we had a few glitches on the uh, on the internet side. Uh, I have with me uh, Dr. Pankaj Kapoor, uh, the legal luminary of a younger age uh, than all of us present here on the screen, uh, uh, to sum up the uh, day's uh, deliberations and, in particular, uh, give a give a view on the present conflict that is going on in the Russian-Ukraine area. Uh, if you could sum up the four speakers and give a view on this Russian uh, Jamela, if I may say so, uh, and uh, what, what, what it might transpire going forward. Uh, over to you, Pankaj. Well, thank you very much, sir, for that. And first of all, thank you, IMF, for this lovely, vibrant, and very invigorating session. In fact, I'm sure a lot of... Uh, People here who are uh, participants uh, have benefited from this. And uh, <clears throat> to start off with, uh, Captain uh, uh, Dixit, uh, he he took us back to our uh, to, to 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 the beginnings of uh, marine insurance a couple of hundred years back. Just to uh, thank you for that, uh, Captain Dixit. But to add on to that, 
he did mention about Queen Elizabeth. I think it was much earlier than that. The Rhodians were also practicing, and there is uh, written proofs of that that they were practicing general average, which was uh, taken over by the by the the Romans, and then uh, finally passed on to the Queen Elizabeth's time. But thank you, uh, Captain Dixit, for that. He mentioned about uh, the, the the cost of uh, cleaning up Exxon Valdez. Well, there was another. Uh, a uh, ship which uh, uh, which uh, attracted a lot of cleaning up cost and that was uh, much uh, recent that was uh, costa concordia and uh, very much uh, uh, highlighted in the media and then uh, the next uh, gentleman uh, captain subedar whom we all have a lot of respect he mentioned that compensation is a befitting loss uh, and in fact uh, compensation and insurance is a befitting loss in fact all the contracts of insurance are contracts of indemnity. And indemnity means that they cover up the loss and not the profit. Uh, then we had a very illustrious speaker like Dr. Saxena, whom I always considered as my guru. Every time I've had a problem, I have always approached him. So thank you very much for enlisting the, the claims which are covered under insurance policy. Please permit me to add one uh, point there that one of the things which are covered is a new addition under uh, ICC uh, cargo, that is the cargo clause uh, A, and that is uh, the damage caused to the cargo because of a phantom ship. That is an addition uh, under, I think, section 14 of ICC uh, clause A, which says that if your ship collides with a, another ship, which doesn't have any uh, registry or it doesn't have any, like we say in Hindi, no mother, father, no my bab. And if the cargo on your ship gets uh, damaged because of a phantom ship, then that also is covered by the insurance. So that is one claim which was recently added in 2014 or 15, I think, to ICC Clause A, I, uh, Cargo Clauses A. Uh, once again, sir, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us that uh, insurable interest is something which is required before you can insure a cargo. but the beauty of marine insurance is that we can even insure a prospective cargo. That means if a ship, uh, let us say a shipper wishes to transport 100,000 tons of iron ore, which is still in the mines, not yet loaded onto the ship, he can still insure it only that the, only that the uh, policy will kick in when the, uh, the, 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 the cargo is on the ship. So it is possible to insure, but that is only possible in marine insurance that a prospective cargo can also be insured. Now, uh, uh, there's the first time I was exposed to Mr. Shafiker, and I'm so glad that I was a participant to this, uh, uh, to this webinar. He brought in some very, very lovely points on the, uh, the, the, the fund, and also for informing us about that oil slick, which he mentioned about off Israel. Uh, they, did the, uh, they did the lab testing and found it, it is from the passing tankers. Uh, just to just to add on to that, uh, is that uh, we had a similar problem of Mumbai High when I was a master on one of the ships of Mumbai High, and uh, we found a lot of oil slick, and uh, they said it is coming from Mumbai High. Uh, but when uh, the the lab analysis were uh, taken, they found that it was being discharged by the ships which were passing by. So we had a similar incident. But thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, and of course, the way you described the accident and uh, the result. Uh, of the international community uh, of, of prestige, which brought in the supplementary fund. Thank you for that. And once again, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Anthony Fernandez, sir. He is a doyen of marine insurance, uh, like Captain Subdar mentioned that no insurance webinar or seminar uh, or conference is complete without uh, uh, Mr. Anthony Fernandez, whom we lovingly call as uh, Tony, sir. I would like to uh, thank him personally for uh, bringing in our history, a maritime history, just to add to what he uh, has shared with us. A few years back, we had a judgment of our Supreme Court on Babri Masjid. Uh, in that uh, um, uh, huge judgment, sections 110 to 117, the Supreme Court mentioned about the maritime law. So, uh, Maritime law is, or rather not maritime, ad admiralty law. And in that, they did take us, uh, Supreme Court in that judgment in those sections, took us back nearly 
two, three hundred years, uh, telling us how admiralty of maritime law has affected our, uh, uh, our country. But thank you very much for bringing that history, sir. And uh, yes, as you rightly mentioned, that in today's time, Holland machinery is a big challenge because of continuous transfers and lack of uh, knowledge of the people who are managing it. That's a big problem as a practitioner of uh, maritime law. Uh, I have experienced that myself. And it, yes, it does require uh, rectification. And you have been very bold enough to bring it uh, to everybody's uh, knowledge here. Thank you for that. Uh, Captain Deshpande, sir, we are fellow uh, speakers. We are fellow uh, teachers and master's uh, classes. What he covered today is one of the most difficult clauses in a, a charter party or a difficult clause in a marine insurance, and that is both to blame. Every time before I became a practitioner, every time I read both to blame collision clause, I was completely lost. But he has made it look so simple. He has made and with with actually with figures and examples and the the way he started off the whole thing with the. A lot of pictures actually uh, we, we, we were all gripped to his uh, pr presentation. But I, frankly, I, I, I don't uh, feel afraid in uh, admitting that it is one of the most difficult clauses in any uh, contract or bill of lading or marine insurance. But thank you very much, sir, for making it look so simple. Uh, and finally, Mr. Balasundaram, sir, the you know, there's, as a practitioner, I do meet a lot of marine insurance uh, firms. In fact, I'm a legal advisor to two of them. And there is always a problem. You have made, in fact, one of the recent cases which came to uh, me was that the cargo was heading for Sudan. And due to congestion of the port, the people decided, the ship, uh, the ship owners decided to go to uh, Yanbu, the other side of the Red Sea, to discharge the cargo. And that delay caused a damage to the cargo. But whatever doubts or problems I had were cleared today when you took up that case, amongst the four case laws, you took up a case about delay of the cargo where cargo was transported by rail and finally the ship owners considered paying uh, a, a compensation to the cargo owners. Thank you very much, sir, for this fantastic uh, uh, presentation and especially those four case laws that made, us, uh, that made the topic really easy. And now finally coming to the Ukraine-Russia crisis. I don't know if I'm the right person to comment on it, but there are practitioners here like Dr. Saxena or uh, Captain Deshpande I, or Captain uh, or um, uh, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, uh, I think they would be the right people to comment on that. But yes, my view is that there have been a lot of ships which are stuck there. In fact, just yesterday, I was in the office of one of the marine insurance companies where... Um, uh, I'm a legal advisor, and they, they had a nearly two-hour-long session about how to cover these cargoes which, uh, on the ships which are uh, stuck in that uh, Russia-Ukraine. And even they are brainstorming, and they're not aware of what to do with it. But I believe that war risk is an additional insurance which a, which a ship owner normally always takes uh, to cover the hull and machinery part of the cargo part, it automatically gets cancelled if there is a war. So they are also in a limbo as to how to do that. But I will uh, request, uh, may I, I rather request one of the panel members to please highlight on this uh, Russia-Ukraine problem. Uh, but finally, please allow me to thank all the participants who have taken the trouble to attend this seminar and not only attended to stay, uh, stick around right to the end, not only here, but also on the YouTube. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, IMF is a very proactive organization and they intend organizing many, many such webinars in future too. And we would love to have you uh, in those webinars and share your uh, questions and answers and views on that. Uh, over to you, uh, Captain Subhadar, sir. And also if you could please Anybody could uh, highlight on this Russia Ukraine war? Can, I think Captain Sir wanted. Can, can I can I come in for a few minutes? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, Dr. Yes, Sasena. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, you see uh, the normal two insurances, uh, the Hull insurance and the P and I, uh, both do not cover 
war or strike risk. Okay. And similarly, the car cargo insurance also does not cover uh, war risk. Okay. So that is a very clear situation. Now, are there any solutions available? Yes, there are solutions available. Uh, for cargo, there is a, a cargo war risk uh, situation uh, solution is available. However, that only covers, uh, I told you already that normal cargo insurance is from seller to buyer. But war risk uh, insurance for cargo is only on the sea leg. Okay, it does not cover uh, the shore uh, transportation, etc. Okay, that is one thing. Now, as far as the ship uh, hull insurance and PNI is uh, concerned, uh, normally the both can be purchased separately. But uh, these big uh, PNI clubs they provide a, a product uh, called uh, um, uh, called uh, war risk insurance, which covers both. So a PNI company will give pro will provide an insurance, which will cover the hull uh, only up to the level up to the limit of the, the insured value. PNI up to a limit of uh, usually uh, five hundred uh, million dollars. Okay, and. Uh, Besides that, uh, the loss of uh, earnings, etc., are also covered in that uh, in that product. Now, as far as India is concerned, we have had uh, from 1976 uh, a war risk scheme, uh, which was there for Indian flag uh, vessels. Uh, that has been uh, revised uh, in uh, in 2004, and uh, I'm I'm just showing you that uh, uh, policy. And if you see the cover. Uh, it covers hull and machinery. It covers any deviation, uh, diversions because of the war. It covers the PNI risk regarding only, you see, not the complete PNI uh, coverage, but uh, death and personal injury, for example, a sea terror, etc. Uh, wreck removal, it covers so labor and the collision liability. Okay. So this kind of a product is available for Indian flag vessels. And otherwise, internationally, of course, the PNI uh, is providing the, uh, the product, which more or less covers the same thing. Okay. I think that much uh, probably should be enough. I mean, uh, I, I can Saksena, talk a lot. <laughs> Dr. Saxena, clearly this, this kind of cover is uh, not applicable retrospectively, as in this case of- No, 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 no. Normally, you see, these covers are comparatively cheaper and the ship owner, buys it for 12 months. Okay, only when the vessel is entering uh, the so-called disturbed area, disturbed area, you see, disturbed area does not mean the war must have been declared, you know. Uh, so there is a list of uh, uh, disturbed areas which are constantly updated. So if the vessel is entering there, then the ship owner needs to inform the underwriters that, uh, you know, for example, we will be there for seven days. Then for those seven days, the premium is very high. But uh, this uh, Indian system, comparatively is cheaper. And that is the reason that uh, during the Iran-Iraq war for six years, uh, you know, our shipping corporation tankers were going in and we could ne we never felt uh, as a consumer, uh, you know, uh, otherwise any other tankers, uh, the, the, the cost of transportation would have gone up tremendously. But we never felt because uh, this high value insurance was uh, sort of subsidized by the government of India. Thank you. I, I thought that was more like a sovereign guarantee than insurance. No, no, no this is insurance. This is the, is the same thing. That is the policy. That was backed by, backed by New India Insurance at that time. Now it is open to all the four insurance companies. Yes, so Dr. Saxena is right. There is a scheme, government scheme, which covers that. It's, it's covered by New India Insurance, yes. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You come to the end of the program about 15 minutes late. Uh, thank you for the interaction and lovely, uh, uh, lovely having you here on, on the IMA webinar. Uh, may I request Admiral Natkarni uh, to close the meeting. Thank you, Captain Sobhidar. And with that, we come to the end of this webinar. And all that is left for me is to again uh, thank uh, all the participation, uh, all the participants especially the guest speakers uh, who have shared their wisdom and experience with the audience, which has no doubt educated and benefited all, especially uh, all the, I think, large number of students 
from various maritime and defense institutions who have been part of this webinar and uh, who may have to deal with issues of maritime insurance in their future careers. I would like to also thank the audience uh, for the very dynamic participation and for asking uh, very pertinent and incisive questions as also to Captain Swabidar for his moderation of the question answer session. session. Uh, thank you once again and uh, wish you all a very great day. You may log out now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pankaj. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saksena. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh,